We are live too. And we are live at, on Oz Profit Investors. We bring the big names. We have the big fun. Hey, and we have the big, one of the biggest names here. We have Nathan Birch, Birchie. Oh, gee, I don't know. How was that? So, how are you going? Good. I'm awesome, boys. Awesome. Thanks for having me on this evening. And uh, obviously, thanks for everyone for tuning in and having having me and you guys as a part of their Wednesday night viewing. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I think so. That's that's uh, that's fantastic for coming on. And I've been a, I've been watching. I was watching YouTube clips back in the day. And um, so you you are you are I suppose one of the inspirations I suppose of of my property investing Ooh. journey. So one of the kind yeah. of yeah, there's a couple of sort of people out there that were out early in the space. So how are you going anyway, Joe? What's what's happening? Mate, I'm I'm going fantastic. I'm absolutely pumped for this one. Big Nathan Birchie. Big, not soon to not be big, mate. You've got some, uh, you've got some, you've got some goals for uh, some some weight loss challenges. So I'm excited yeah. about that one. So you might not be calling you Big Birchie anymore. <laughs> yeah, I'm still like six foot four and hands like dinner plates. But I remember, I remember years ago, people used to say to me, Birchie, have you been on the gear, right? And uh, people used to think because I was like at the gym all the time. I was like eight times a week. I'd be at the gym. I got really big, and um, I took it as a compliment when people asked me that. But no, I'd never. You know, too scared to take a Panadol. So, um, with it now, people say to me, Birchie, go to the gym, you're fat, right? And uh, oh. yeah, I want to lose 20 kilos. So, I want to go back and get big again. So, yeah. So get, it done, get it done, mate. Get it done. What about you, Jeff? How are you, mate? I'm excited, man. Just a uh, yeah, pretty, uh, pretty chilled kind of start to February, but uh, but I know it's going to absolutely ran hot. We're going to buy some. Well, I mean, I, don't know, I was going to say you and I are going to buy some properties. If you're definitely going to buy properties, and I am keen to buy property as well. So I mean, we are an Oz property investors. So exciting times. And for those people tuning in, uh, throw us some comments, throw us some questions. I know there's going to be heaps of them. And if you're watching on YouTube later, we love the comments and that all that sort of stuff as well. So um, yeah, and and let us know. So let's uh, let's get straight into it, Joe. Should we go with the quote of the week? What what is yours this week, Joe? Or should I go first? My quote of the week. My one's nice, easy. Um, I read it in a book years ago. I forgot what the title is now. Um, oh, but it is. Gotta... You can get absolutely everything that you want if you help other people get exactly what they want. Um, okay. So help Zig as many Ziggler, people mate. get that, what. That is Zig Ziglar, the the motivation, the man of motivation. That is him. That is my quote of the week, and I think um, yeah, that's it. Done. I like it. What about you, Big Jeff? What have you got here for us? Big Jeff, I have to look it up because I do it. Uh, so my mine is by Ralph Waldo Emerson. So I believe he's a, I don't know what I don't know what Ralph was. I think he was a speaker or so maybe not a speaker. He was an author, I believe. He said, "Do not go where the path where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail." So I, I thought oh. that was appropriate given we've got a trailblazer um, on on the pod. So I wanted to uh, wanted to honour. On it yourself. So, what about you, Virtue? What, what, what have you got? I don't really follow quotes, but I was thinking of a couple of things, right? Now, I think they're very fitting for this evening's conversation that we'll have. Um, the first one, I'll think it back to the Matrix, right? We're talking about X in the Matrix, right? And yeah. um, everybody, I know that a hot topic at the moment is interest rates and, uh, you know, all those sort of things. And some of the things I might say today might be quite controversial. And, you know, I just encourage everyone to take a deep dive into it. But think about the Matrix, right? There's a scene where the kid's playing with the spoon and the kid goes, yeah. is it the spoon that bends or is it your mind that bends, right? And I hear so many people that are scared about debt, right? And we're living in a world where everything's fake. We've got fake media, fake news, fake food, everything, right? Most importantly, fake money. And the reason why all of our properties are going up, it's not necessarily that whether the best investors in the world and all those sorts of things, everything's going up, whether it be a packet of chips, whether it be a, an old Datsun, everything's going up in value. So is it the property that's going up or is it the money that's losing its value? Right. So if you're thinking about the mm. assets, you know, is it the, the asset going up because it's good or is it everybody needing more money to buy the same thing because the money's lost all its value? And if you take debt to the other side and think about the debt, does the debt really exist? Does the money, did the money ever exist, right? In the last year in Australia, we've printed a trillion dollars worth of money or currency, right? It's really currency. It's not really money. We've printed more money in the last 18 months than what we had for the previous 200 years in this country. That's why we've got everything going up in value. So when you think back to the, the matrix, is it you, the mind that bends or is it the spoon that bends? The reality of it is, is, is the money even real? Did it ever exist to start off with? And he gives a shit about debt because it probably doesn't even exist anyway. Wow. <laughs> but but is it the, the spoon? 
I want to know now. which it's one like is a chicken, protein. Chicken or the egg? Well, the I mean, spoon doesn't matter. exist. The spoon doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, the, the spoon's spoon the RBA. The computer. <laughs> the spoon's yeah. the RBA, right? The money never existed. So how yeah. can you be worried about it? The debt doesn't exist. The money never existed. So who cares about the debt? You only want <laughs> the physical. Okay, so that is that is probably the best summation of what this conversation is going to be. So. Um, we're going to run our, our sponsored ad at the moment right now, but everyone get ready for more of that. Um, but we're going to go dive deeper into uh, virtue your views and opinions on the blue pill, Joe. Which one are we going to take? We're taking red well, and blue. Well, that's we're going to we're going to sample both, right? Tonight we want to understand virtue is what happens if interest rates rise, what happens if interest rates drop, and what can the everyday person do about those situations? So. Um, yeah. let's run into this sponsor, sponsored ad because uh, we'll, we'll, we've got to get to it and then um, we'll dive straight in. Love it. Well done, Joe. Selling a property. It isn't something we do every single day. There's actually more involved in the process than you may initially think. Like, how do you find the best agent? How do you ensure that you're going to pay the lowest fees? It's not easy. And then also throw in all the stress and pressure of selling. And that's why Scott Agger, a former real estate agent and expert property negotiator from Hello House, has created his leading agent finder service. After a 20-year career managing agents himself, Scott has personally conducted over 3,000 property transactions, along with running Three Bell franchises. He knows all these agent tricks. Scott has created an in-depth five-step process for his leading agent finder service. First, he establishes the true market value for your property, he uses a triangulation method to shortlist the leading agents, creates a competitive environment for those agents to send through their best proposals, vets those proposals, and then he negotiates the best agent fees for you. This ensures that you're not only getting the best rate for selling, but most importantly, you have a leading agent on your side selling your property to maximize the end sale value. Oh, and did I mention, this service is completely free. If you'd like to know exactly how Scott runs his five-step leading agent finder service, he's detailed it with the link below. Or if you'd like to speak with Scott to help find you the leading agent in your area, book a call today. Here there we go. it is, yeah. Scotty Agard. So let's uh, let, let, let's get in. I've, I've got a bit of an. I, I was reading your bio early today, uh, so Virtue about and what I wanted to. I wanted to keep it short and sweet so we could get to the get to the goal, get to the value. So. Um, you start investing though at 18 on on a 30k wage. So that's that's to to further highlight your point you were making before we we threw to our sponsor. And and you, you're working in real estate. And then at 24, you said, you know what? I've had enough of the matrix. I've had enough of my day job. I'm quitting in two, in 2009. So just kind of around the GSC time. And and this is just around the time I was starting uni. So crazy time. After yep. you bought 14 properties. So tell me a bit of a story. I don't. I think that was the year you started being invested. Maybe you started before. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. Um, it was around then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's say around then, and and then you sort of went on to buy. I mean, the number of properties you, you've bought a lot of properties. Let's say two, over two hundred in in diverse locations. So you're not just bought. I mean, we'll talk about the first one. I'm sure there's hundreds, but and you're now yeah. currently aiming to buy a hundred hotels as well. So you, I think you said so you're about thirty or 20, thirty five. Thirty five. Yeah. There you go. So yeah, what, what I know. So that was a. There's many highlights in there. You were the investor of the year, I think. But I don't know which. That was the when they printed magazines still. Years, back in the years day. And years ago. Back in the day. Nowadays, <laughs> just nowadays, I just have fun with life, right? And uh, yeah, I just have a laugh with it. So I, I remember back in the day, like I was in like a property investor magazine. I don't know which one, but I was the investor in the year. But front page. <laughs> yeah, something. Like that. Well, I used to be on the media all the time. We'll get into that later about how I think all that's a lie, but um. You know, just looking at the, the, the propaganda that's out there and how they position things, what's real and what's not real in the, in the world. But I guess I grew up in Western Sydney. Everyone thinks I grew up in Mount Druitt. I didn't. I bought my first property in Mount Druitt. Um, I grew up near Parramatta. Um, I don't have a story to say I was homeless and all those sort of cool things everyone tries to throw in to make themselves sound even more impressive. I just grew up in a family which everyone worked really hard. Uh, my dad had a heart attack, died at the age of six. Well, I, was, I was 16. He didn't die at 16. He was 62. And um, I just, at age of 13, I thought, like, I don't want to have to go to work. Like, I used to get every grade, every year, the teacher would say, Nathan has potential. He doesn't listen, you know, whatever. And um, I thought to myself, what does everyone else around me do? And everyone's stressed, right? Everyone was stressed about working and money and have to be controlled via, you know, you must be here to earn your money or you don't eat food. And they weren't living great lives anyway. So I just, I realized hard work was a part of the equation. 
And I thought if I could sacrifice till the age of 30 uh, and buy properties, like rich people had properties and I had, there was no internet to think back then, right? There was no way we could do a podcast. There was no realestate.com. There was no, um, you know, way of communicating. Who was your, who was your motivation, right? Like how, how did you get um, into the property space? Like what so, were you reading? It's actually a detailed one about my family like situation. Like one of my brothers bought a property for my other brother that couldn't keep a rental property. Let's just leave it at that, right? <laughs> he couldn't stay in his rental property. And um, yeah, like my brother's about 20 years older than me. I've got three brothers. And um, yeah, I was like, I saw my brother move from house to house. He couldn't keep a rental property. And my other brother bought a property. I was like, that's cool. I want to have a house. And I thought about it. I was like, people are getting paid 800 bucks a week, which is like a 80 grand wage now. It's like 40 grand back then. <laughs> And I thought to myself, how could I get 40 grand a year by doing nothing, right? And I thought, well, if I just had five or six properties owned outright, that would bring in the rental income and that would be it. So I worked out where could I find the cheapest property? That's what led me to Mount Druitt because I didn't have a car. I couldn't get anywhere. So I was like, where's the crappiest area that I could find that's cheapest things and the roughness goes on. And the area that I grew up, there was a bit of house commission in similar, like in close proximity, but it wasn't where I was. But I saw those areas change, and I remember my family talking about how those areas were rough, and they weren't rough in the future, like in, when, in the present time. So I thought, well, I'll just buy five of them. And I thought, well, if I buy five of them, how am I going to pay them off? So I thought I'll buy ten, and if they double, I'll sell off half, pay out the other half. And it was just inst- ah. like very simple strategy. And then I thought, how could I ever buy ten properties, right? No, no one I know has done that. No one, like, there's no way. So I thought, well, if I just bought, work real hard, work two jobs, sacrifice from 17, which is when I started my full-time employment, <clears> to the age of 30, I could somehow buy a property every year and have a few years where I didn't buy something and hopefully, you know, all that. So I hustled real hard, worked two full-time jobs. I never earned over 100 grand a year. I tried to earn 100 grand a year um, from 18, 19, 20. And I thought to myself, you know, so many people I know have children and uh, they don't have the opportunity to be able to, you know, do stuff. So I thought if I could have two incomes, double the average income, whilst I was young, I could just plow all that cash, live at home as long as I could, live on ten grand a year, try and pay no tax, and you know, keep as much as I can, get seventy grand, eighty grand, that could get me one or two properties a year. So I went along doing that. I got to about. I remember when I quit my job, I had about fourteen, fifteen properties. My cash flow was about thirty grand a year passive, and I had about two hundred grand of equity. I went and pulled out. 200 grand of equity. And the day I quit my job, I realized that my job had run its course. I was earning 100 grand a year. I was in a management role. I was actually 24. Um, I worked for News Limited of all places. Yeah, don't hate me on it. But um, the I irony. Worked, yeah, the irony of it, right? And, um, and I thought to myself, you know, if I come to work and earn 100 grand, I'm selling myself short. I can't get loans anymore. I've, you know, the banks don't service me, whatever. So I thought to myself, if I have 30 grand income and if I could take my 200 grand, buy a property, flip it once a year, make 50 grand, I'd have 30 plus 50, um, 80 grand a year, I could live a healthy life on that. So I went off to do that. That's actually, um, that's, that's a really interesting way of, of thinking about it because you sort of say people are like, oh, you know, how do I, how do I sort of borrow more money to be able to quit my job? But it's like, okay, well, you've kind of just flipped it completely and said, well, how much income am I actually earning? And how do I, you got 30 and then you got another sort of 50 from where are you getting that other source of income from? So you sort of say, okay, yeah. if I do one, one deal a year, that's, yeah. I mean, there's, there's risk, of course. Enough. Enough. It's, um, yeah. it's just interesting the way you think about that. So I bought all my properties. Everyone thought I bought crappers out in like remote locations. Um, I bought all in Sydney and those sort of areas. And then um, I remember at the time, it was like 2004, like the summer of 2003, 2004. I was 18. My girlfriend at the time, she was like 19 or something. We went for like a Christmas holiday to Queensland. And just remembering there was no internet, like no real estate. There wasn't, no one had a website. It was like, you're lucky to have a mobile phone. And um, I heard about this place called Logan and uh, I went up there and I could find townhouses, units, villas and stuff. Sydney market had popped. So everything had gone crazy in Sydney back at this point. And um, I thought, you know, I'd heard of people getting ripped off in Queensland. So to put it like, yeah, they fly you up there. The real estate agent with a suit, they sell you this crap. They have a BMW, they drive you around. You walk away with two house and land packages and no one had the access to the data to see that they were being ripped off. So they just thought it was cheap, but they're really paying too much, like 50% overs. 
And yeah. all I'd heard about was like people getting stung in Queensland. So I went to Logan and I looked at these properties off $50,000 each. So your Woodridge's, your, all those places. Like I actually went online the other day and I saw the house is like 500 grand for a house and that they were like 50 yeah. grand, 60 grand, renting for 120. And I had three thoughts in my head at the time. One, uh, Queensland never goes up. I'm going to go broke. Everyone else went broke. It's no good. Right. Second yeah. thing was um, uh, I can't go and do a renovation uh, on the property because if I go and do a reno there, then um, you know I can't change a tap washer. Third one is that I was looking at townhouses and units and stuff. They don't go up in value. And that was my mindset at the time. And as Sydney went into a deep recession, like properties that were selling for 300 in Sydney were selling for 200,000 for six, seven years. So up to about 2008, 2009, the Sydney market crashed. And in the Queensland market, those places in Logan, and that went from 60K to 80K to 100K, 120K, 150K, 200K, right? And they kind of like tripled or quadrupled. And I realized at that point that my opinion cost me lots of money, right? And those so what was so, it? So you didn't, you, you didn't actually buy, in, you didn't buy those 50, no. 60, 70K properties. Ah, uh, when yeah. that market crashed and they went back down to 120K yeah. or 30K, I bought heaps of stuff there. Yeah. I bought about 50 out there. So, yeah. Do, do you see any parallels? like any similar signals to what's happening right now? Like clearly everyone knows we're in one of the biggest booms ever. I had a, yeah, the biggest, one, one of the biggest booms. Do you see parallels between what's happening right now to what was happening back then? I do and I don't, right? Because thinking back like in 2004, 2005, interest rates started to go up and money got tight and it was pre-GFC though, it had printed so much money to get through the dot-com bust and all that sort of stuff. Um, looking at the um at the market like interest rates went up to like nine percent so a lot of people say oh virtue you may have had it nice and lucky you bought stuff at 200 grand 150 grand and now it's four five hundred million bucks whatever but interest rates are now two and a half percent for a lot of people i was i fixed my interest rates out of fear at eight and a half eight point six five percent was my stupidest rate i fixed right and i thought the sky was going to cave in but um you know rents are double or triple what they were back then and the parallels is like people were actually going bankrupt 10, 15, 20 years ago, right? In the current market, we've just seen two years where people could have put their houses on pause and not uh, pay a mortgage. And that has never been seen before him. So for the parallels in the market, um, they've avoided yeah. a crash because they've artificially created on this free money interest rates of the rba was 7.25 percent when i quit my job right i was fortunate enough that my 30k passive when the interest rates dropped and all my loans went down one percent two percent three percent i went to 50 60 70k passive cash flow because i had the asset base if i didn't have the asset base i wouldn't have been able to move forward so it doesn't matter how bad the markets have been over the last 10 20 years it's about carrying those assets to a time where the money loses all of its value, which is where we're at at the moment. So I can't really so, draw. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you can't really draw too much of a comparison to right now because it's no. a completely different situation of what's going on. If interest rates go up from 2% to 3%, you can see shit. No one's going to go broke unless you really <laughs> screw yourself up. Right. So, um, yeah. so before we, before we start talking about interest rates, cause I know that's an area that we're going to, it's very on topic right now. It's on trend, but um, what was your asset selection process back in the day? Um, and what does it kind of look like at the moment? Like, what does it look like today when you're buying property? Yeah. So um, looking at like the houses that I was buying, I was actually thinking about so having a chat with um, one of my business partners who own, lots of different business. One of them's a accountancy firm. I was talking to uh, Ridwan earlier on today and um, just about my motels and stuff. And he's like, dude, the funny thing about what you do now is that the same client tool that you bought the house for are the same client tool that you'll go and take them on the holiday for, right? Because it's like to the motels. But um, I started buying <laughs> properties because they were affordable, right? And I thought, you know, where could I find the cheapest house? My first seven or eight properties were all houses. There had to be a house on land, right? Until I got to a point of that and I asked my broker, um, so I'd used a bank and then I couldn't use yep. a bank anymore. So I went to the broker and the broker said, you can't get a loan for like a 250 grand purchase. And I was like, damn. And I found this little townhouse and I was like, this thing sold for like 350 five years ago and I'm picking up for 130, right? 
I'll take a punt on it. It was this, after I realised that this the, is on the Gold Coast. Gold Coast, wasn't it? I think. I, I, no, this is in Sydney. This is in Sydney. Oh, Sydney. Um, wow. And then um, when I asked the broker that, she said, "Nathan, you can buy this property." And I was like, "Okay, okay cool." So I couldn't buy the big one. I could buy a small one. And then the penny really dropped at this point. Another one came up in the block and I was like, well, I didn't blow my arms and legs off by buying a townhouse. It mustn't be that bad. So there's another one came up for sale. Someone I can buy for 130000 as well. So I went to go buy that. And um, that was in a suburb called Tregear in, in uh, Western Sydney. And um, I went in and I picked this thing up for 130 And my broker said, yes, you can buy it. And I came back to her afterwards and I said, hey, you lied to me. You told me I couldn't get a loan for 250k. I just bought 260k worth of property. Ha ha ha! Why did you try and trick me, right? And I was like, "What's going on here?" And then what I realised is, she goes, "No, Nathan, you don't understand how it works. You have now two rental properties, and you have two sets of income coming through. So instead of getting 220 a week, you're getting 190 a week, but you're getting two yeah. times that. So you're really getting 380." And I realized at that point, it's not about what I want as an investor. It's what the bank wants from me to keep giving me more money. So the aim of the game, um, I heard this thing about Monopoly. So if you want to go for a second quote, I'll throw it in here. This guy was playing Monopoly with his grandma and she was teaching him how to play Monopoly. And then he wanted to win. And she told him, look, it's about owning all the assets on the playing field, right? It's not about having the piece of paper. It's about having all the assets. I've never played Monopoly in my life. But I heard this and I thought it was pretty cool. So he studied it, studied it, studied it. And he went back and he won the game of Monopoly and he like owned his grandma, right? And she was like the master of it. And then she goes, great, you've learned the next lesson. But there's a lesson after this, right? And then he was like, what's the lesson? And she goes, now we've done, you've owned everything on the playing field. It's time to put it all back in the box, right? <laughs> but oh, okay. so it goes back in the box, right? And the same thing happens to all of us, right? Hold on, are... hang on. What do, what do you mean it goes back in the box? <laughs> well, you I won the built this empire. I don't want to put the empire back in the box. <laughs> no, but... So yeah, does that mean, does that mean, is there another board that you need to play on? Is that what you're sort of saying? No, so this is a spiritual one, right? This is a spiritual uh, one, right? Okay. But, like, everything goes back in the box. The houses were here before we were here. There were players before the kid was born. The granny's been playing it for the last 50, 60, 70 years. So yeah. you can win as much as you want in the game. But thinking back to the Matrix, does it ever exist, right? Did the game ever exist, right? You're just playing a game. So all these people wanting money, they want assets, whatever. I don't even care about the properties that much. Now, I don't even care about the properties. They're just a part of the playing field, right? And people go and focus on betting on a horse. You want to own the whole race course. And I realized, if you think about, and this is something I learned really early on, I don't care about money. I have a zero respect for money, right? I don't have any. It always disappears out of my account as quick as I can get it. I don't go to sleep with more than 10 grand in my bank accounts. It's always gone. I empty my accounts every day because I know that cash flow will keep coming through and I try and acquire an asset every week, every fortnight. I just keep buying them because it's more of a game now. But a lot of people take it too serious because they think, you know, I must have this, I must own this, I must own that. Just remember that players come and players go and the board was here before us. These houses were here before us. They'll be here behind us after we leave. And I realized that in my life, I can either be stuck in the matrix being forced from a boss to have to do what I want, do what they tell me to do and all that. My two jobs, one was in sales, like in an um, you know, account management role. The second job was working in a pub. And I remember bundying in, right? You were two minutes late. You'd get told to send home, get out of here, whatever. And it's like, who's going to... If I wasn't working for this person and someone spoke to me like that in public, I'm not a violent person, but you'd want to hit them, right? You'd never have a relationship with that person. But you had yeah. to because you had to do it for the money. So for me, it was about getting assets that could provide that I didn't have to. So if for me now and throughout the whole career of my investing it's not about owning um you know a property or doing a subdivision or rent or anything like that i just want to be able to cover my bases and once i cover my bases with cash flow then i can do whatever most people buy a property they sell it they get rid of it but if you think about it i've never heard anyone call me up and say birchie i'm so happy i sold a property 10 years ago they're always like i wish i bought more so have you sold any property I've sold about maybe 50 over the years. Um, probably bought about... I don't know, <laughs> you, say, you say that like it's not very many. Like, like 50 is a lot of properties. 
yeah, maybe, yeah. You know. what, what, was the, what, 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 what was the re- Did you sort of sell them so you could get into bigger assets or is that kind of? Uh, I've never had, I, like, so sometimes when I was earlier, like I haven't sold a property for maybe five years or so. Um, I sold yeah. some properties five years ago when APRA changed lending laws. I was trying to settle 10 yeah. worth of asset. And I, I remember that. Yeah. Uh, um, and then, so I maybe sold 10, 15 back then. Um, and then um, I sold some properties because I bought them with the purpose of selling them and taking that cash. But that's because I've been stuck with finance. Um, so ultimately, like most people look at buying a house or buying it, they say a property and they normally say a house. So I want to buy a house. And it's like, who cares about the house? I don't care if it's a house, a townhouse, a unit, a villa. Initially, I wanted only houses until I realized how the game worked. And it's all about keeping the banks happy so I can get more and more of those papers that never existed. And then because it's so fraudulent system, the papers lose their value. The currency that we're using is worth nothing. And then the assets keep rising. So, so, about- so okay, because I think this is, a, we're going we're gonna to go, we're going to get Alice involved and we're going to go down the rabbit hole. But yeah. um, in terms of asset selection nowadays, how, like, are you going to be buying on a main road, across the road from a brothel like do, is there a, a comparison like do you not buy those things or like there's let's, surely let's, this let's, pres- let's say joe it. so before before we we're chatting so I, 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 there's one point that i want to um that i think a lot of people hopefully it, it you sort of gloss over a little bit but i think it's vital um yeah. is is that you need to understand the person who, what the person is giving you the, the money the, the the paper the whatever it is the ones and zeros what that person is wanting to wanting to see okay. the bank because if you don't understand yeah, no, I that, get that. I get that. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but also to the point that, that so that's I'll what we'll be diving into next. But I mean, in terms yeah. of the asset selection, like how yeah. do you go about well, selecting four. that asset? So there's, there's, there's four things. There's four things you said before the show. You? <laughs> you said, far out. It's so coming out of Nathan's mouth. <laughs> with, with the, um, the the property selection i'll buy anything so last year um i bought an acreage i'm just trying to think back what i bought i bought a couple of blocks of land um i bought two waterfront properties um i bought a unit that i one of my clients said no to so i just bought it and i said you're a dickhead and i bought it because then i thought it'd be funny to show them that i bought it and laugh and make a video at the front of it and say look at what i just did i bought it and it's gone up um, and I did the same thing with a house that uh, was on the Central Coast. And um, the, the house on the Central Coast was 390 grand. And uh, it's like maybe 500 metres from the water. I bought it for 390. A fibro across the road just sold. This is a brick house with tile um, and a gr- garage under the main roof, like a modern 15-year-old house, 20-year-old house. This fibro house is about 50 years old, just sold for like 750. So... Um, yeah, so they're just very standard properties that I buy like that. But in the so, how do you way, determine that rate, right? Like, how do you determine value? Because you're not just so, buying the seven hundred thousand dollar asbestos um, yeah. shack; you're buying I, the five hundred thousand dollar brick. I want to know that. So, I always thought to myself, when I, I'll just go back to the early start, the early yeah, yeah, the yeah. Early, I always thought to myself because I remember I was actually talking to someone today about it. I was trying to buy a property. Um, in Mount Druid, actually, it was a house. It was like a two-story house. It was this decent sort of size house. Um, and it was like 170 grand or 160 grand bank repo. And I had money in the bank, like 50 grand, 40 grand, something like that. And I needed a buffer back then. I thought a buffer is very important. And I said to my mate that's a real estate agent, what could I sell it for? I think it's sort of like 280, 270, whatever. And he goes, yeah, he goes, you could sell it for that. I said, how long would it take you in a worst case scenario? If I don't sell this, I always say to myself, I'll go bankrupt, right? Always in my head, I go, will this property throw me over the line, right? Will it cause a big trouble? Will it? What will it do? And he said to me, it'll take you maybe eight weeks to sell it. And I said, well, if you don't sell it in eight weeks and it takes 12 weeks, then I'm in trouble. I could lose out. And I got fearful. I never bought the property. The reality of the story is that now it's worth um, probably about a million bucks for that, for that property. Um, uh, yeah, it's what they sell for oh wait um i forgot where i was going with that story actually you had a well the good- the point was like you you were saying that it's 170 oh. but you're buying it's 270 and you're buying at 170 yeah how so do you get to that i wanted to make sure that worst case scenario if i got myself in the shit that i'd have to sell the property and get out of trouble and not lose my shirt 
So I wanted to make sure at that point, I didn't even, I never actually knew at the first say 10 properties about equity. I didn't know about equity. I just bought, just worked two jobs, saved up cash and whatever. So I thought I just want to buy it in case I get myself into trouble and I can sell it. If I can sell it and get my money back as a, you know, very distressed sale, because that's what happened back in the day, distressed sales out there, then I wanted to make sure I could get out unscathed. So buying at below market value removed my risk. If it's 20% below everything else, then, you know, that's my first criteria. Second one is that it needs to be paying for itself. So if I lost my job back in the day, then I would need to make sure that if I was working for 20 grand, 30 grand a year at Macca's, that I would be able to pay for, you know, food and basic living expenses, whatever. And that property would have its own heart, lungs and respiratory system to look after itself. That's why I wanted cash flow. Third one is making sure that it's got room for upside for growth. Um, that were the three criteria. But nowadays, um, I realized what was going to happen in 2016 with some financial markets and I sort of overlapped a lot of things. Um, and I realized that we're going to go into massive inflation and the cost of everything is going to go through the roof, which is what we're seeing at the moment. Uh, and I very deeply documented it all everywhere. Um, but I realized that buying properties that were below the rebuild cost is very, very important. I think that's something people should be very mindful of today because we're looking at houses in, you know, it doesn't matter if it's on the Gold Coast, in Brisbane, in Sydney, $2 million for a house with no ease, 300 square meter block, all that sort of stuff. And it's like the value isn't that attractive. But if you can pick up a place in 2022 for 200 grand a house on a slab or a townhouse or a unit, you can't even build a granny flat for 160, 170K now. If you could pick up a whole freestanding property that used to sell for 250 for 180, then you're buying it below rebuild, you're buying it below market. People so how do you more. do that, right? Like how do you find those actual properties? Are you like, are you looking at just, you just know the markets and it says, oh, but this one's come up at 180. Why is it here at 180? And it's previously sold at 250. You're like, great, there's a bargain. I've got X amount of percentage here. Just looking yeah. at comparables. Every market, like markets aren't all cyclical, like they're not all in line, like it's not just straight line in the market. Um, you've got yeah. markets within markets, you've got counter cyclical markets. So back to my example of in Sydney in 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, the markets crashed, but in Queensland they took off. So I realised that there's yeah. two different markets. Um, and then I look at that and I think to myself, okay, is this market like overvalued? Is it oversold? Why aren't people going here? Why did people come here before? What could change this around? And I want to pick up stuff on their dirtiest and, and worst sort of day. And that's sort of, yeah, what I like to do. Um, I'm a contrarian investor. So people say to me, should I buy Bitcoin, right? And I'm not going to go. You're a there, what investor? A contrarian investor. So contrarian. Oh, contrarian. 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 Right, yeah. sorry, sorry. So if people say to me, oh, should I buy Bitcoin? I'm like, hey, Bitcoin's at 90 grand or 60 grand or 70 grand. What's it ever do it on the day? Yeah. Why ask me that now? Why didn't you buy it when it was two grand or five grand or seven grand or whatever? And people get caught up in the hype. And mm -hmm. I look for things that were of value. So I won't buy certain assets now because they are too expensive. Or I don't see the value. If a property goes up, from 500 grand to one and a half million dollars. It doesn't mean that it's a good property to buy at one and a half million dollars. It's probably the biggest dud in the world because at that point, the downside risk is so much greater, but the upside risk is minimal, right? What would the yeah. wages have to look like? What would the market have to do to go ahead? Um, so I look for markets that are really smashed. And if you think about like, if you could find any market in Australia that's like 200 grand or less, let's say you put down a 20% deposit today, that would mean that you get a 160 grand loan and a 40 grand deposit in on the property. 40 grand is an achievable entry point. Lots of people can save that up. If they put a 10%, it's 20 grand. 5%, it's 10 grand. It's, you know, sell your car and get it. Um, but 160K loan at 3% interest rate, 3% of 160 would be 3,200, 4,800 a year in interest rates. Uh, 4,800 divided by 52 would be about 95 bucks a week in interest rates. Um, to hold on to that asset. So the chance of something going wrong is very minimal, but the average wage and the average person out there could afford to pay 300, 400, 500. So there's more significant movement is because of affordability. And what I've seen over three different market cycles over the last 20 years of investing is that when people control interest rates, 
if people if interest rates were six let's say you had a million dollar house at a five yep. or six percent interest rate that's 50 grand a year worth of interest that the family's paying if it doubled in value to two million dollars that family would have to earn a hundred grand a year to pay that interest when if the whole household income's 120 grand before and tax and all that sort of stuff though they can't afford it but if the interest rate went down from six percent down or five percent down to three percent or two percent that means that the value of that property could double and the repayment could stay the same so look at everybody's repayments and what they're servicing for and servicing calculators and you can start to see the data and the trends of this data occurring of where other areas can afford and people can afford to to buy um and i research markets like it doesn't matter if it's south headland which went to 700 grand for a two-bedroom townhouse down to 50 grand or 30 grand for a townhouse like every market's have their day i'm not a fan of mining towns there's times when i'll jump into mining towns grab all the stuff and leave um and i'll go in and take like 500 properties 300 properties for myself and my investors and i pick them up for 50 grand sell them again for 200 250 if they want but it's a way of making very quick money because the markets get you know you buy them on the worst yeah so let, 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 let's just say you're sort of looking at it oh sorry joe i was, I was gonna go let, mate, let, let's just say you're looking at a 200k sort of property and yeah. uh and you're sort of saying okay this is affordable and all that sort of stuff how do, how do you then sort of do that you said you're not a massive fan of mining towns but you have sort of picked yeah. them up so do you, do you sort of if you're going to hold it for a longer term and not sort of flick it on or sell it would, yeah. would you sort of would you want to see economic drivers as well as in as a diverse yeah. kind of um industry I like buying in capital city. So for example, a lot of people don't realize this. I've been picking up about 50 properties per month for myself and my investors for the last maybe 10, 11 years, just in the Gold Coast and Brisbane. So I've bought a lot of that stock, right? And now I'm seeing these things that we bought for 150 go to 400, right? Some townhouses are picking up for 200 that now selling for 600. They're not remote areas. The Gold Coast was crap market for a very long time. I'm not buying yeah. them. I buy one or two a month now out of all the properties that we secure because that market is too hot to be picking up. There's too much risk in that market. Um, I think of a well diversified portfolio, you need to look at what I've got a question, right? This is for everybody to think of, right? A little game for us to play comments, with, right? yeah. Comment on it. Yeah. Let us know your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. People comment on this. It'd be a good one, right? How would someone get to Perth just hypothetically how would someone get to Perth well if you're Todd Sloan uh, you're gonna walk yeah <laughs> <laughs> he walked from, Perth, uh, he? yeah he walked yeah, from, walked from Melbourne, so. yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 but it's a good one people you'd say probably, you fly you'd there. probably fly there I suppose you'd you'd probably fly there yeah you probably you'd probably get you'd have to get to the airport as well though you'd have to map out your journey you need Where, to where's your end destination if you live in Perth, you just walk there, right? Yeah, Long will you fly there. But if you're in Sydney, then you can fly, right? If you're in New Zealand, you can't drive, but in Sydney, you can drive. At the moment, no one can get to Perth because they've shut the borders, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. um, if, let's say, for instance, we chose to fly, right? We know Perth's over there, Sydney's over here, we go to get over there. But reality is, is that a plane isn't going to land at my office right now, right? Like I'm in Bella Vista here. It's like maybe 45 minutes out from the, the city. And um, I'm going to need to catch an Uber, a bus, a train to get to the airport and then fly. But then I need to plan my trip because if I've got a, a destination I need to be at for a wedding or something like that, when I get to the airport in Perth, I might have to catch a bus or hire a car to get to the other side. So in that journey, you might need five different modes of transport, but it depends on that timing to get from one destination to the next, to the next, to the next. And I think as an investor, most people look at the property as a destination rather than a vehicle. And how I see it is the property is purely just a vehicle to get you to where you need to be. So you need to work out, people say, oh, I don't like that place, it's a unit, or I don't like that place, it's the Gold Coast, or I don't like that place, it's Perth, or wherever. Hmm. Who cares what it is? You need to keep the bank happy. The playing board that everybody's playing on that's watching this right now is playing with the banks or their own cash. If they're using their own cash, it's like you're just saying you're going to drive until the petrol runs out. If you're using the bank's money, you've got lots of different vehicles to get to. But the game of it is to get the largest asset base because the market doubled tomorrow. 
and you had a million dollars worth of asset, it'll double from one mil to two mil. But if you had 10 mil worth of property and doubles to 20, that's a cool position. Yeah. <clears throat> so if the bank would say you could have one million worth of houses or two million dollars worth of townhouses, I'll take the two million dollars of townhouses because the two million will turn to four million. I just need to have. So what is what? What does the bank want? Because I love this. I love this analogy that you've done as well. Because it's made it just you. You don't care. These you, you could be buying. You know, just rocks for all you care. As long as the bank wants rocks and people want to rock, you can just you know leverage against it and have the asset. Rock on. But um, so you don't really care that it's property or whatever it is. It's just buying that thing, and it's going to allow you to get to that next stage. But Correct. yeah, property is my favorite go to because you can leverage it. Uh, the banks will like to lend on it. Uh, everybody likes to speculate on it. Um, it takes physical labor. People live in it. There's, there's, yeah, there's I think an the, inherent yeah, people, people which, live which in it. <laughs> we've, exactly. we've, we've been doing this. We've been doing this shelter thing for I don't know, hundred thousand years or what? I mean, two hundred thousand years. So there's kind oh, of wow. a yeah. It's, there's an attraction to it. So when you sprinkle over the top of that inflation, which is the the, the the fraud and corruption out there in the money. Well, system. I was looking at the RBA and inflation's only at 3%. Tell me what's gone up by 3%. <laughs> <laughs> what's gone up by 3%? Gas prices, mate. Gas up. prices. I mean, they, they, don't include, they don't include the cost of fuel in, in uh, Before, CPI, don't You used to get like a steak and they call it as meat. Now you get a sausage, but now you don't even get meat. You get that fake meat, right? <laughs> yeah, like, some faking. <laughs> yeah. And that's the, Beef. That's the, that's the thing, right? Like inflation's the biggest killer. So the cost of copper, for example, I've got a bag of copper coins here just randomly, right? Someone posted them in. They're just pennies, right? So the copper price went up from like two bucks to like 10 bucks. So the cost of the per kilo, <laughs> so the cost of the electrical wiring in your wall has now gone up five times. Semi. Yeah. Yeah. Semiconductors yeah. as well, right? I mean, they can't, they can, because there's, I mean, supply issues for a start, but, um, it's, is it a supply issue or is it that people don't want to sell their product for the money that's being offered, right? Because people don't want yeah, the money. I don't know, is it the spoon or is it the... Yeah, they're, they're rejecting the currency. Like, if, mm-hmm. and if you think about it, like, think about we now got in, inflation on shipping containers on steel. So who wants to sell a shipping container to put your stuff in to send it from China to Sydney or to Melbourne or wherever, right? So then if that shipping container and the cost of sending that shipping container was two grand and now it's gone on to eight grand, everything inside that shipping container has gone up astronomical, right? You have to add four times the amount of freight to that product. So the inflation is creeping up no matter which way you want to see it. But if you already had, let's say, a, I'm trying to, I don't know, move to, let's say this piece of this screw hook thing, right? Let's say if I wanted to get this hook sent from China now, let's say this was two bucks beforehand. Let's say all the extra shipping on it would now cost $2.50 to get it here. If I own this mm-hmm. screw already and I go to sell it, I'm already ahead of the next person because I don't have to pay for the shipping, don't have to pay for all that. So when I'm building yeah. a house or looking at an asset, there's physical labor, physical materials that's in this property, which can be it's already built in. Away. Yeah. So we've got leveraging of an asset we've got a cash flow being bought in from that asset we've got very low cost for that money if they put up interest rates everybody dies so we'll get into that later but it's a really cool recipe for the asset the actual properties to go up in value and you know i've you asked about what i bought beforehand or what i buy now i used to buy a little residential house it still doesn't change like maccas have a really yeah, I might get sued from Maccas for saying their burgers taste like shit, but really, right? Who feels healthy after eating a Maccas burger, right? Yeah, I, I don't feel good after. Yeah, it's not great. Right? People make better hamburgers than McDonald's, right? But I'll tell you what they don't have. They don't have a system as good as Maccas, right? They might sell a burger for $30 and Maccas sells one for a dollar that's now $4 or whatever, but put that aside. Maccas have a solid business of a hamburger that's very cheap and they have a process in place and a strategy. Their business strategy is solid, right? The other hamburger shop that sells a better product isn't solid, right? So as an investor, like I think it's important to have solid fundamentals. Just because Mac has became successful and has so much wealth or so many locations or whatever, they don't start selling pizzas and fine dining, right? They still sell the same hamburger. As an investor, I don't go, oh, I've got all these properties, whatever, and start buying other stuff. I still buy the same shit that I bought. <laughs> 
a decade and two decades ago. But I do add in other stuff now, which is, you know, I just get, I see that there's other vehicles that I need. If I want to go to the moon, I ain't going to get there in my car or the plane. I'm going to need a rocket. So yeah. are, you, are, you, are, you going to, are you going to target Elon? Is, is Birch going to get into aeronautics? When, when, when are we getting Birch, uh, Birch moon, moon prizes? I don't see it happening anytime soon, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so what you're saying, so what you're saying is, um, like, from a larger asset base, right? So, a million dollar property, you just don't yeah. see value in a million dollar property because the building may have cost half a million dollars. Let's say a really luxury build is half a million dollars, and the land is worth then half a million dollars. You're just like, well, there's you're at a million dollars because the land's worth this and the house is worth this. Except if you go out into the rural and the sticks, you've got a $200,000 house on a piece of land and the whole place, the whole thing is selling for $200,000. There's a deal there because to replace that asset is going to cost $200,000 plus you've got to purchase the land. Correct. Correct. And I want to just throw in something, right? Like I see, yeah. like, uh, like thanks for that, inviting me in the community and I've seen, I get like lots of alerts from in here, right? Like, from Oh, like mate, my favourites, uh, are fa it's favourites when we, we start talking about Logan. We've been talking about Logan recently and we've been riling people up. It's but sorry, favorite. go on, mate, go on. I saw, I think you guys did a show recently with someone that talked about Deception Bay or Caboolture or something like that. Yeah, that, that, was, that, was, yeah. that was us, I think, yeah. That was yeah, us. Yeah. On Australia. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I saw there was like a heading of deception. We came up with like, oh, deception bay. I know that area, right? I'm very familiar in that area. So that's an area that I picked up street by street, townhouse by townhouse, whatever. I picked up everything in the area. And the reason being, is I mean like hundreds, if not thousands of properties that we've acquired in there. And I've picked up these town, these units, for example, in Caboolture. I'm going to throw it out there now because people go, oh, where's Birchie buying, right? I'll talk about it when it's done. It's not before it's happened, right? But yep. <laughs> I've been picking up these places like Edward Street, Caboolture and places like this, right, which were like 160 grand, 170 grand for a 10-year-old townhouse renting for <laughs> 330 a week. You couldn't build a two-bedroom unit for that. Poor sods that got spruced to by you know, off properties. Brand suits and ties and glossy brochures and stuff. They were paying like three twenty, three thirty for that. Yeah, 350, I like. saw those. I saw those yeah. properties. I know. Yeah. I know that, they, and, and they're worth like probably $220, 230 two forty. If so, that. they went. They went all the way down to one forty, one fifty, one sixty. Mm -hmm. There was one. The cheapest one I bought was one hundred and ten thousand dollars, and that was last year. It was a one better in there, right? Renting for like two fifty a week, and Jeez. now you can't buy under three twenty, three thirty again. And all I thought when I bought those things is right. <laughs> here we are in the city of Brisbane, right? We've got a market, which is the first market to take, not, not so the city, but it's like it's in yeah. the metro regions of it, right? Within an hour, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not... It's, out, it's, it's out not in the sticks. Right? It's not in the middle yeah. of, you know, Ooh, nowhere. Yeah. yeah. Um, Lovely place. Yeah. Never been there. It's on the list to do. Um, the, the, um, <laughs> the thing is, is, those things I'm like, there's going to be a demand here. Someone paid 300 for this. They had a confidence that if they bought it for 300, it's going to be worth 600 one day, right? So I'm thinking like, if I'm picking it up for less than I can build it for, um, if I'm picking it up for 160 and everything else is selling for 190, I can go back, pull out the equity, go again. But ultimately, I've got the cash flow, look after it, blow rebuild cost, blow market value and upside for growth. Those things are now selling for 300, 320. I picked up properties three months ago for people in and around there. And I'm talking townhouse. One settled today. One of my staff bought one um, today that settled. There's a three-bedroom townhouse for like 240000 230000 for it. That will sell for three fifty today. And that's only to settle today. So 50%-ish so uh, or maybe, yeah, maybe 50% yeah. and whatever, like a couple, 12 months, whatever. So what, yeah. what wouldn't you buy on Edward Street? Right, we're talking Edward Street, Kabulcha. I was making it up, right? Like, just you know, yeah. I'll buy it there. I revalued one recently for 275 that we picked up for 210 like two months ago, three months ago. The market has shifted. Um, and we're not yeah. talking remote locations or anything like that. Like, remote locations could be okay, but and we'll get into that later when you ask me some questions. I know that there's a couple of questions that people ask about how to like, we'll talk about the vehicle. To get them out, to get them back into the bank's lending perspective, like I'm going to talk about that into yeah, true. Can yeah, I, well, that's a massive we one. Right? The, uh, 
before we go down the, I, I, I want to throw a location and, we'll, and then we'll talk about interest rates. I think it's important. We're already sort of 50 minutes. But um, yeah. let's just, because I see a lot of people in the group, they talk final Queensland, they talk uh, Cairns, um, Townsville. <laughs> and if, if you can't, if you're already buying these areas, um, feel free to yeah. um, say, yeah. we're not talking about it. But um, because I yeah. sort of see people saying, <laughs> only, only live, don't people. worry. Yeah, yeah <laughs> only, only 100 plus people watching live and probably thousands <laughs> or who knows. So, so Townsville and Cairns, like I'm just because I see people say 350, 450. I, I, I'm not sure that there's necessarily value in that kind of price point in that in that particular area. What are your What are your thoughts? Yeah, it'd be really good if it's 350. If it's 450, I want a block of four units for that. Yeah, um, okay. that's my yeah. thoughts in those areas. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've been buying in all those locations for many years. I, the cheapest one I bought was $20,000. I bought two of them for myself in Cairns for that. And I've, I've bought three others that I sold. Uh, I bought them cash and I needed cash, cash um, at some point. So I just sold them and took the money because it helped me get into the big subdivision the sort of properties that I got. Um, but yeah, like I've been picking up there when they were very low. I think that some of those areas have good value what i always want to overlap is i want to overlay data from today and six months ago and 12 months five years 10 years ago if this yeah. is, i'm just making up like i'm just really spitballing <laughs> here right with these numbers I like let's, it. Yeah. Say, let's say that a, a townhouse in logan was 120 grand and a townhouse in cairns was 100 grand i'd rather take the logan over cairns because it's in brisbane metro region right and whilst it's got a bad rep today or it's getting better or whatever some people might hate me for that but you know if we know 4114 we know what it is right i would take that any day over the cams one because the upside is far greater right it can have regenerification but if we're looking at a house in woodridge for 500 grand or if we're looking at a um a townhouse in Townsville for a hundred grand. I'd rather take the townhouse in Townsville for a hundred grand because it hasn't gone crazy yet. So, um, is it important to go and buy a whole portfolio of those type of properties? No, you want to have like you need to work out your position and have a good solid game plan as to what vehicle do you need to hop into at the right time. Uh, I see so many people come to me and they say, oh, "I want to go subdivide. I want to buy a house and a duplex and all this sort of stuff." Is that the vehicle you need at the moment, though? Is that what you say at all? Correct. Yeah. So I see people. They go, okay, I'm going to buy a block of land. I'm going to build a duplex on it. I'll sell them off, make myself two hundred grand, right? But then when you go to buy the next property, you have to pay an extra 100, 150 grand on top, and then the build's gone up in value, right? So have you really made the money from doing the development, or have you just gone up with inflation and the cost of goods of everything's gone up? So that's where the market's at. So I'm not a big fan of buying and selling these assets, but if you had the opportunity to buy five properties at 200 grand a piece or you had the opportunity of spending a million bucks on a block of land building a townhouse selling it off making yourself 200 grand reality of it is is that at the end of this year you'd have one of two outcomes you'd have five properties if those properties were 50 grand below market value each from day one that means you'd have 200 grand times five which would be a million bucks that'd be worth 1.25 without doing anything and you're collecting cash flow from day one or you'd have this property you built it you've got to sell it now because the cash flow doesn't add up on it and then when you sell it you'll have 200 grand in your pocket after getting extorted from the state the agents the, the stamp duties all that sort of stuff capital gains tax all that so yes, you'll have so you're... five properties and a ton of equity and cash flow coming through to sort them out and those properties will go up with perpetuity with the market or you'll have an asset that you've sold, you've got 200 grand cash, and then you have no asset. You got to work out: do you value an asset? Do you value cash flow, or a, a, an asset, a, a cash? Now, if you go back to 2020 and say we did that scenario and look at today, your 200 grand cash, if you had it in your bank, would only buy you half of anything, right? Of what it would buy you to, back then. So, yeah. Strategy. So if you buy, so <laughs> doing a development, you're saying is by the time you've sold it, it's worth less than what you <laughs> you could have if you just held a number of a million dollars worth of property rather than trying to flip a million dollar property. And, and what sort of risk, I suppose, have you taken as well? Because you, you run through, you've got costs, you've got some, yeah, you've got all those kind of potential risks of not being able to sell it or people sort of, yeah, I mean, depending on depending on market, well, of course. 
I'm super interested to hear about interest rates because I want to take the red pill and I want to take the blue pill with you tonight, Nathan, and see what happens if we have, like, in the Matrix, sorry, the Matrix scenario. Um, We're not in Amsterdam, uh, bro. Bloody hell, We're not in Amsterdam. No disco biscuits for me, thank you. But what happens when we take the interest rates? What happens when it rises? Well, let's not go with what happens when it rises first. Let's go with what happens if they um, if they remain the same or drop. And then let's go with a scenario of what happens when it goes over. But we do have to run our final ad. So we'll do that right now. And then we'll jump into the interest rate discussion and cover that off. Um, let's do it. People are loving it. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yep. Commercial property offers the highest cash flow in Australian property investing, offering exceptionally higher yields than residential. Now we're talking eight to 10% net yields. That's cash after all expenses, not this two to 6% gross that we see in the residential space. So for those that are starting out on their commercial investing journey, it can be exciting, but it's also a step not to be taken lightly. The expertise of a commercial buyer's agent can pay dividends to help you secure that high cash flow and high growth potential property. And this is why we recommend Steve Polisi of Polisi Property. With over six years experience in the space, Steve has over 1,200 property transactions under his belt. He has seen it all and knows the best locations right for growth. In a previous life, Steve was a chartered mechanical and structural engineer, so he draws on his mathematical and analytical skills that he's developed to break down what works best in commercial property. As with engineering, same goes with commercial property. It's based primarily on the numbers. So if you're curious about diversifying into commercial property, you have access to $100,000 in cash or in equity, book a call with Steve today and find that perfect asset for you. Here you go. Messy. Oh, Joe, Joe's even put an outro on there. Where's, where's Joe? Oh, here we go. Hey, Edit, that's, that's all... <laughs> Too slow, I Joe. I this is it. Like, you're going to have another beer, yeah? Are you? Yeah. Oh, it's, no, it's got to close the door as well. Lucky it's not seamless, live. Joe. Absolutely. Absolutely seamless. seamless. So, so let's uh, let's let's talk in, and before we talk in trades and where they go up down, or this is, of course, not financial advice, folks. Um, I mean, Birchie's bought a few properties in his time, but. Um, but so, which one, you want to talk about going down or staying the same first, well, Joe? Which one well, what have? happens? Well, exactly, because my biggest concern right now is what happens when interest rates increase. But you know, what happens if they just stay the same? Is there any kind of crazy scenario that plays out? Do you see Nathan, or or is the real concern when it just starts to raise? That's when we get a kind of yeah get in trouble. Um, I'm gonna just go back to one thing first, right? And it's I find it very strange, right? Just in life, right? We get only two options, right? We only get two options. You get the red pill, blue pill, pill, right? (laughs) We get liberal or labor, right? We get, you know, this one. I don't like the other couple of options. There's some crazy ones out there. Right? It's and it's it's like why is there why is there just two options? Why do I only get two options? Right? Why? Right? So. You've got options inside of those options, right? So you've got the red and blue pill. What about if you took both of them? That'd be a freaking exciting, you know, adventure for people to go on, right? I don't know. You'd be like, just trying to think how that works out. You mean rates going up and going down at the same time? I don't know. But then what about if we didn't take a pill? I don't want to take a pill. I don't take pills. What do I want to take a pill for, right? So it's like the options that we're presented with are that you're forced to take two. But if we realize that the money never existed, right? Let's just go back to the start, right? The money never existed. It never existed, right? So what does that mean? The money never existed. What does that mean? Can I call my bank tomorrow and just say I'm not paying a loan that did? No, no. Where did yeah, it what do you mean? From? Money doesn't where exist. Did, where did it come from? Where did it, Why did everyone become wealthy? If Let's say that there's 100 people watching tonight, right? And let's say that we had $100, right? And everybody had a dollar, right? And let's say we want to buy... I only had water, it's empty now, so yeah. But let's say right. I wanted to buy the beer that Joe has, right? What Joe's beer, and it's a dollar, right? Each one of us can buy a beer, it's a dollar, right? Me and Jeff go, well, we want to go halves in it, we'll buy, we've got two dollars, we can outbid everyone else, we'll take the beer for two dollars, you'll have two dollars plus your dollar, you'll have three bucks, we have a half a beer each, right? No matter what it is, we cannot have more than a hundred dollars to pay for your beer, and we all get a sip each, right? We can't pay you two thousand dollars for your beer because it didn't ever exist, right? Yeah. So how could these things go up so high if the money existed beforehand, 
right? Somebody, somebody changed the rules, didn't they? Fractional the rules banking. Change. So when we start seeing a trillion dollars worth of currency being printed from our beloved governments, right? And you see, you know, liberal labor, whatever, right? I don't, I'm not a, I'm politically atheist, right? I don't want to know who's the avatar that's coming in. I want to know whose hands inside the puppet, right? And there's layers and layers of deepness, right? I think about like these guys and I, most people go, I hate the bankers. I hate this. I hate the system, whatever. And it's like, I'm just intrigued. I don't hate anything, right? I just go, okay, well, that's interesting. Who's the person inside that, right? What's the, and I try to have creative thinking and people don't do that a lot and people get slapped down and, and whatnot. But I yeah, think about they get, it. they get angry at the face that is there, not necessarily the, the thing controlling it at the other side. Correct, right? And we're now in a system which was created before we existed, right? This system was here before us, right? So just think back to the Monopoly, right? Before it was in the box, right? We come and played the game. It doesn't matter what crap I collect and you collect and we all collect and everyone watching collects. When we're gone, it's gone, right? Someone else is going to collect it some other way, right? So when I look at this game now, it's like, I'm playing for my kids, their kids, grandkids, all that. Right? It's just a game. It's not. I don't take it serious. But everybody's trapped because they're only thinking of the two options, right? Of work, don't work. You know, there's everything has a reaction or action. But we need to think deeper for every decision that gets made. These guys printed off. The government printed off a trillion dollars of debt. Right? Let's just put it into perspective. A recession that we had to have back in 1992. Right. Um, a lot of people were very angry by that because Paul Keating said that, right? And everyone hated the Labor because of that. And remembering I'm politically atheist, Paul Keating was probably correct when he said the recession we had to have, but he doesn't control the system, right? He's just there. And as soon as he said that, he got taken away from the game and another avatar got put on. Um, reality of it is, is that every country in the world had a, a, a recession at that point in time. Mm -hmm. We just happened to have had that. No one looked at that. They just looked at inside, inside our country. Um, but then when we look at the debt that was left there. There was $96 billion of debt that took 10 years of the beloved Howard government to pay back, right? And then here we are in 2020, the government in three months prints a trillion dollars, 10 times what was created that caused the last recession. They printed that out of nowhere, right? A stimulus package is here you go, take it, everyone gets free money. So as that money is being printed, People are getting job keeper, there's businesses getting grants, there's all this stuff going around the system, flushing around. People are like, well, I've got a bit extra cash, I'll go buy myself a new car. The person at the car yard's got all these orders coming in for cars because people are trying to get rid of this cash. People are trying to get a loan for it. Imagine so what you're saying what, what you're trying to say is I've got a beer here and it's it's three quarters full, and they just keep putting a shandy into it. They just keep topping it up with lemonade, and then they Eventually keep growing and going, and then soon. I'm diluting my asset. I'm dilating Currency. my value yeah. and the, the value and the, the, the number, but it does get bigger. I'm going to be having nothing but a full shandy and they're going to call it a beer, but it's actually going to be nothing but watered down lemonade. Correct. So That's the numbers are going to continue to grow. Correct. Now, there's two options, right? Let's say we're all going to drink from that shandy, right? If people don't want it's to come on more than two, though, Virtue. You said you said there's more than two options. What's the third or the right. fourth option? So there's many, right? So we've got to think of the reality, right? We're driving the car, we're driving 100 k's yeah. an hour, we're driving the five k's an hour, we pull off to the side of the road. There's these ads of car accidents. The faster you drive, the further you fly off, right? It was a bad yeah. ad for accidents. That's but, right. Was that the crash? Was that the crash dummy one? Yeah, the crash thing, right? So the more yeah. faster you're going, the smaller the turn, the quicker you fly off, right? Here we are in a system where if the interest rates at the moment, right, we think of interest rates as 3% and 2% and all that. We've got to think about wholesale markets and where the funding is coming from. If you go and pull out charts of the M1 money supply and look over growth, you'll see that there's more money in the M1 money supply. It's in the trillions of dollars that's been printed off. The, the currency that's washing around that system, they're pouring that shandy in, right? No one wants the lemonade. They just want the beer. The reality of it is, is that the more that they print, the more that it goes up. But everybody's now is attached to this cheap, dirty credit. No one's got a beer anymore. No one's got anything in their hand apart from Joe, right? But the thing is, is that no one's got money. They've all got debt. If you think back, every time we've had some sort of glitch or a little recession, they just keep printing more and more debt. In the last, um, 
the <laughs> so I'll just write either so, M1. So what, hang on, sorry. What is the M1 money supply? Because I don't I don't know what that so is. It's the so total money supply in circulation or printed. It's been created. Or? Yeah. So created, think yeah. about it this way, right? Like if you they've just printed if you want to so put it up this, the chart here. Yeah, so this the, is that's, twenty that's, that's, that's exponential. Yeah. Okay, so this is the US, which is what are your views on this compared to Australia? I, I don't know how to well, get an Australian connected. one. They're all connected. They're all connected. So um the, the, you look at the M1 money supply in in a in Australia, like why did they disconnect it? Right? You've got all this line that you've got there um that's gone across all these years. What why is that um why did it just exponentially shoot off, right? Our currency is dying, there's no value left in it. Now let's assume, and I'm trying to make it the most simplistic form to not blow over and you know minds too far, right? Okay. <laughs> um, I like the more advanced, but yeah, keep it simple. I'm sorry. So if everyone's got debt at two percent and three percent, right? Going back to my example beforehand, the person that bought the house at a million dollars and they could afford a mortgage at five percent. If it went to two million dollars in interest rates, two and a half percent, they're still paying fifty grand a year in interest repayment. Yeah. Now, so they can afford rate, to buy a bigger asset. The person that come later, that's now at the buying at two million, if they had to go to a three percent interest rate or a four, let's just say they went to three and a half, three point seven five percent, went in the middle there somewhere, that means that they're now paying nearly eighty grand a year in interest. They're going to die, right, financially. So even if it just went up by one and a half percent, game over. So if we start looking at who else has taken on debt, right? Everyone here's got debt, property's got debt, whatever. What about the cars that are out there on the road? People wouldn't be buying those cars. Those car yard dealerships wouldn't be having a job if they were selling cars on 10% interest rate because they have to be at one, two, three, zero percent interest rate for them to be able to offload the car. The car is not the vehicle anymore. Ten years ago, before the GFC, they commoditized the car. So everyone would have yeah. a car that's 30 years old. Now, if you have a car that's 10 years old, you're like, who's this guy with a 10-year-old car, right? That's yeah. a whole different story about If you go out. to a car yard and say, hey, I've got cash, I'll buy it today. They're like, I don't want to deal with it. We I want your finance. The finance. Yeah. yeah. So they've commoditized it. The property is a commodity, mm. but greater than the property being the commodity, the human is the commodity because they're stuck in that system paying the taxes, right? Everyone's a tax slave, right? They're not selling the battery cells like they have in the matrix. They're selling the, the, the tax. They're selling the human labor. So when I look at things of value, I'm like, well, the human labor for that is very important. I'm a very strong believer. I think the older I get, the more boring I get, right? It's, yeah, some of you may not think I'm boring, but... Um, <laughs> the, the bag but imagine now that we've got all these properties, not just the properties, we've got every company. So everyone in the business world that's out there, each company could take a $250,000 loan without any real risk at 0% interest rate during this, I call it the scamdemic. So I don't mean to ruffle any feathers here, but throughout the last so, few years, they've printed so to bring up, Yes, Sorry, you kind of, you kind of lost me a little bit, but... Um, well, what can we do about it today, right? So what you're saying is chill out. Do not go and buy an asset where it's highly negatively geared. Um, don't buy the $1 million property. Maybe let's just split that up into two, well, four $250,000 properties because you've got the cash flow that can support it because when, that, when the cash rate does raise or do you think it's not going to raise and there's no yeah, way that the government... That's that's the that's the boom 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 that I was it's, getting to. It's right? kind of like it's. It, I that, feel like it's almost Russian Russian roulette, right? Because they kind of, oh, they're maybe not Russian roulette, but like a almost playing chicken. It's like all jawboning yeah. because they're talking they're talking about raising, but I, I personally think yeah. that if if they it's do, like they're in if, a bit of trouble. If it's like if someone comes in, do you remember when you're at school and you'd find like the class bully, right? It's like I'll meet you down at the train station at three o'clock. I'll smash you, right? And, and nobody will meet him because, because you're like, like, if I do, he might smash me. But you go down there and you're like, where are you, right? Like, where's this person at the thing, right? So the, the, the point being is that they are talking, but they haven't actioned yet, right? So yeah. we need to go and take a deep dive into what would happen if they actioned any rate rise, yeah? yeah. So our rates are 3%, 2%, 5%, whatever we're paying. Thing is, is that 
what we didn't have two, three years ago is we didn't have every business hooked up to this cheap debt. So we've got the government that's printed a trillion dollars worth of currency and sent it out there. Then you've got banks guaranteeing 250 grand loans. So a car, a business goes and gets a new fleet of cars to keep the economy going. We've got the government, just think about the government with their debt of a trillion dollars. If they're paying the interest rate of point one percent so 10 basis points so for those of you that are watching 100 basis points is one percent so 10 basis is 10 percent of one percent the government and everyone that's taken out these bonds which is how they buy their money they don't go to the bank to cba and get a loan they buy bonds the government buys the bonds off them at a set figure if they have to now go back and get these bonds in two years one year three years five years and those bonds roll over at a higher rate if they're at a 10 basis point and it goes to 1%, which is 100 basis points, the cost of each person's debt has gone up by 10 times, right? So everybody's stuck on this cheap debt now. If the but debt goes... I think you my... lost, lost Joe again. I think Joe... No, you, haven't lost, you, haven't lost, you haven't lost me. But my, my thing is, is, right, does it work both ways? Because when the economy, when the interest rates dropped a full... 100 like 100 basis points at like it went through there wasn't um like it wasn't doubly better like i didn't feel right. like oh my gosh we've got all this extra cash it didn't feel like that but how can going back up be so drastic it can't be that yeah, bad because all these people that have got this debt will now go, now go bankrupt so if you've got a million dollars worth of debt um and you're used to spending fifty thousand. all of a sudden it doubles now you've got a hundred thousand and then it double the the rate raises again you've got two hundred thousand dollars then you've got three hundred thousand dollars and you're saying the government won't allow this because well, it would well, it's be irresponsible it's something. i don't know it's if it's the, same, the government it's the, the government it's the government's owner right government's really middle management without going too technical the central banks that control this money that print this money and send this money off that They've printed so much money. If interest rates go up, everyone will go bankrupt, literally. People won't have money. We'll have the most severest depression. We have printed way too much currency to draw it back anything. There's a bigger problem than interest rates. There's a bigger problem than interest rates because interest rates really don't... Oh, that do inflation. No, no. That, right? Where are you taking us? Just disclaimer, everyone. This is going to get very interesting. <laughs> so... And I only realized this last week. So I haven't actually put this live anywhere or anything. So this is like something really Jeez, exclusive. This is exclusive. the exclusive. Um, last week in the um, RBA's minutes, they, uh, I remember going back in February 2019, Philip Lowe, the chairman of the RBA or whatever, he said that interest rates will be going up. And I said that not before 90 days and not after 120 days will they see their first 25 basis point cut, which we saw on the 4th of June 2019. And then they dropped in sync from that because there was a way that you could tell beforehand looking at the cash rate futures. But that's irrelevant anymore. And interest rates should be negative 3% in my view right now. But they didn't. What they did is that they bought up bonds by printing lots of short-term currency, right? Which, which they, artificially, they artificially sort of press, push, push the yield up. curve down. Correct. So every week in Australia, the central bank buys $4 billion of bonds, right? So just thinking about this, right? Let's go back to the 90s. $96 billion of debt in five years caused 10 years of pain. Each week, the central bank is printing $4 billion of bonds and buying the debts of $4 billion. What they have said last week is that they will be stopping it on the 11th of February, right? Every okay. central bank around the world is in sync. So if they stop buying the bonds, that means that there's no money out there in the system anymore. That causes a big enough problem because it starts putting everything into a bit of a recession. So we could see six months, 12 months, 24 months worth of recession. But is it going to really affect anything? Because the only way the treatment always said from before this occurred that the treatment is going to be problem that the bigger problem than the solution. They've printed too much money, which will cause massive inflation. They're trying to stop the inflation now and hide it and throw it under the rug. But it's too big. They've they've started this beast. If they re reduce their debt, suddenly we're going to see things falling apart. If I'm very confident that we'll start seeing a bit of a glitch in financial markets, specifically paper markets, whether it be 
crypto, whether it be shares, and this is no financial advice to anyone. It takes a while to go into property, but it could if it goes long enough. Like we saw the Sydney property market crash from 2017 to 2019, and then 2020, it started taking off again. The amount of currency that's being printed is being reduced. So it's not just the interest rates that I'd be concerned about, it's the amount of money being created that's being removed from the system. It's not even being removed. They've left it there, but they're just not making any more of it, which would cause a bigger to it. Yeah, they have to keep adding to it and they have to keep it cheap. If they put the interest rates up by 1%, everybody that's got debt now at 10 basis points will be paying 10 times the amount of money for that debt. So it won't just affect mum and dad in the property, it'll affect everybody. Deflation is not allowed in the system anymore. It has to be inflation. If deflation hits it, it crumbles. Like the whole system, the whole society that we know crumbles. But, have to keep but, but we've got, how, how does that work? Because we've got all of this money now, right? We've got 10 extra trillion billion dollars. Things, the paper markets can't go down because there's all this, there's, the pool is now very the only, the only way to keep the party but going, it, Joe, is to make, make more of the thing, like continue to exponentially increase. Yeah, but there's the no thing. hole in the leaky bucket, is there? Is so there a imagine, is there a... So imagine if you had a... You said something really important beforehand, beforehand, Joe. If you had a $500 credit card and you couldn't pay it, and then you go to the mm -hmm. bank and instead of them saying, don't worry about the $500 credit card, we'll give you a $1,000 credit card. You can't pay the $1,000 credit card, they go, we'll give you a five grand credit card. That's we'll irresponsible. Yeah, irresponsible, right? But the reality of it is, is they, they own you now, right? Gestapo yeah, owns exactly. you because they've given you that that credit, right? And that's the system with everybody that's here in the system. We're playing in the system, which we believe we're playing in the chessboard, but there's a bigger who owns the board, what's surrounding the board. So I believe the economy is a Ponzi scheme, is my view. The reality of it is it will die of a hyperinflation. There's a thing called a hyperinflation. Um, in the last 1,000 years, there's been over 10,000 fiat currencies. Fiat currency is the money that we use. And um, I don't expect everyone to get all this stuff. There's a, actually a series. It's a guy called Mike Maloney on YouTube, and he explains it very well. But he talks about gold and silver and stuff. It's called The Hidden Secrets of Money. But basically, there's been thousands of dollars type currencies beforehand, and they've all died of a hyperinflation. And a hyperinflation is where everything goes up super high. And the if you go and look at Zimbabwe, uh, Venezuela, um, Venezuela, all of them, Argentina, Turkey, Turkey, Turkey's gone through, not to the extent of everyone else. The worst one in history was Hungary with the Hungarian Pengo uh, imploding in 1940s, um, going back into Hitler with the Weimar government. Back then, the, the one, yeah, the one, the one that that's the one that a lot of people know, the Weimar Republic, where they people had the wheelbarrows of cash to go and yeah, buy I, loaves of bread and all that. Sort of, yeah. I have a so question this, about um how much money's been done in the thing, right? How much money's been printed? Like if we go back and look at this chart here, that's yeah. you know that's all of this combined. I mean, I don't, I haven't done the numbers, but that looks like all of this combined over a year, two years. Yeah. So yeah, it's like, it's why like, it's like if, if you look at it. Joke. If you, if you yeah, look but, at it over every country that's in the world, if you look at Australia's M1 money, if you look at Australia, not the US, you'll see a different chart. If you can bring it up on the screen, it'd be really exciting. Like yeah, you yeah, might yeah. Find trading economics or something. Um, okay. Just so everyone can get an understanding but that... My, my question... my Sorry, mate. Yeah, my question to that was, why isn't everything far more expensive? Like, like why isn't it like holy dooly well, craziness? Who's seen a third world country? I don't travel around the world. Funny thing, I have 20 mil worth of debt. I think it's about 17. I don't even know anymore. But I haven't ordered it. Worth... No auditing. <laughs> Whatever it is, mate, let's call it 20 mil. Um, yeah. I'm fine with that. Getting me on an airplane, I'm scared. I'm actually going to get a helicopter license shortly. I'm fine in a helicopter, but um, I'm going to have my little helicopter. With the wings. But, yeah. <laughs> That's when you struggle. <laughs> I've, I've never been overseas to other continents but i do understand I that, here, yeah. like like say an asian country with like a five hundred thousand dollar of their currency to buy a hamburger type thing you know what i'm mm -hmm. referring to like these currencies why do they have so much money it's because it goes down have a look here this one's very very important for everyone to look at right that is our money that's been printed go if you go to maximum of it 
from 1980 because it changed in 1971 that's when the fraud really started people didn't realize it right everyone Took comes out all the these gold, experts, gold standard yeah is off the gold standard but then you keep seeing that there's glitches and in 2019 in september that's when everything crashed and then they had to really revive it and see the amount of growth that's just happened and each time you see these booms if you overlay that with all the booms and busts that we've had you'll see the 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 volatility in that that shows how much growth we've had so but combine that um, let's see what was the other line joe had but um we, I, I, that's, the trend, uh, that's the trend line Oh, trend. Yeah, just okay. the trend, where it's going. You can't reverse broke, that. Broke in the trend line. line. Jeez, just going if you to take the all that money away, everyone dies because they were dying already financially. So when all this system crashes, right, debt becomes irrelevant when you have inflation, right? So yeah. if money... So if what does that mean? Debt becomes irrelevant... Because you have inflation. So what do you mean because by that? Because inflation gets rid of the debt. So oh, if you right. had, let's say that you had a, a, a house that's worth 100 grand, right? Back in the day, yeah. like I said at the start, um, I was looking at these properties that were like 170 grand and I thought it was going to go bankrupt. So 170 grand at nearly a 10% interest rate is 17 grand a year. But a million dollars at 2% is the same amount, right? So that house didn't get any better. No one's job employed more. No one didn't get any better. What happened is the money bought less. You need more money. Just like if you want to have that beer and keep filling it up as a shandy, right? It's, the more, it's more shandy than anything. Yeah. But then if you want to have the same amount of beer to get drunk, you're going to have to drink a shitload more of shandy, right? So the thing is, is that the more money that they print, all my assets, the reason why I laugh about the 20 mil or less worth of debt is that the properties have gone up in value. The debt has stayed the same. The, the debt is locked in as today's currency, but you're yeah, paying yeah. it off with tomorrow's worthless currency. So as we go through this system, you can see the amount of fraud and manipulation in that currency. They have to keep this system alive. They have to keep firing more into it. If they don't keep increasing that credit card, then the whole system implodes. So I shouldn't be concerned about interest rates rising as much as I should be concerned about the fact that they're stopping the flow of, of debt than, and money supply into the system. I'd be more concerned about the money supply being stopped, um, the amount of QE, because those stimulus packages have kept this world alive. Like, it's not just Australia that's got these programs. It's every single country around the world. Um, yeah. So, it, it's so, so what you're thing. saying is, I don't care what I buy. Because I know that when I buy a hundred thousand dollar asset here with pure debt, let's just say you get a hundred percent LBR. I don't care what it is because I know in the future this thing is going to be worth more, um, and my debt is going to remain the same. A hundred thousand is going to stay here, and in ten years' time, this asset is going to be worth a lot more. And all I have on here is a three hundred thousand dollar asset, and a hundred thousand is sitting back here in the past. So you're buying future Good value. Idea. By having I'm, debt, I'm not. I'm not sure Birch is quite saying that, Joe. I mean, to some extent, oh, I, that's yes. exactly. That's exactly. Oh, what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. I, I used to say, like, okay. I do these things like with my investors, like uh, strategy sessions, and I used to have this thing where I'd say to people, like, just buy if you want to have a hundred grand a year income. So I always get the end goal right. If it's if it's going yeah. to Perth, what's your financial goal, and where are you now? What do you need to do to get there? So someone might come to us, and they might have, I don't know, fifty grand. And they might have 100 grand income and they want to get 100 grand replaced. So we work backwards and go, okay, 100 grand a year is two grand a week, right? Two grand a week mm -hmm. and an average rent of 300 bucks a week is, you know, you need seven properties at 300 bucks a week to get there. That's paid outright unencumbered. So there's a few different ways to get there. One, you could just buy the properties, work hard, earn all your money from your job, right? People literally will go out and spend. 20 years earning a million bucks but you could literally buy a million dollars from the bank at 25 grand a year and get a better return from it right so working for that money and selling your time is a bad game is losing decades of your life to sell your time for money the time money is the only thing we can't get more of the money never existed they have you trapped because they have this illusion of it so the spoon bend or the mind bend but does, does but, time does time exist so nathan i want to know or, or is time just a so it's a tax on your consciousness. I have no time. Like you're very, we're very, I made sure by Carolyn today that um, that 
from my team that we were here at 7 30 before on the dot normally i'm late to everything because i just i'm just traveling through earth right like this is just like we're all just time right the time is what our belief <laughs> system holds right it could be whenever it's kind of like this. Yeah. i like this kind of more philosophical so, thing, yeah. so it's like it's how you dig, dig, dig deep into it but if you had seven properties to get to retirement and you work hard you're going to be selling the next 20 years to get that an easier option could be is that you buy 14 of them they double from 200 to 400 you sell off seven pay out the other seven right but no one ever calls me up and say birch i'm happy i sold a property 10 years ago because if i bought it for 200 sold it for 400 10 years ago and now it's worth a million bucks i'll be spewing right yeah so if we well i mean th that, th that's a game like this whole buy buy seven and then sell down seven and then pop them into there and have an un unencumbered pop yeah, buy like... 14 sell seven have seven left but, yeah. exactly but like the, that was what's, but what's the better option right if you had 14 okay. properties and they're giving you 100 bucks a week passive income right yeah. that's 1400 dollars a week that's 74 grand a year 72 grand a year that you don't have to get out of bed for 72 800 that you don't have to get out of bed for it just comes in passive so instead of selling the asset you can keep that asset and it goes up in perpetuity with inflation but not only does yeah. the asset go up but the cash flow gets inflated away as well but yeah most importantly if you go forward and let's say we bought 10 properties in 2010 and in 2014 there were 400 green you could have sold five paid out five you'd have five properties owned outright but if you owned all 10 of them in 2022 and they're worth a million bucks a piece, then you could sell off two of those properties and pay out the other eight. You've got more. So the inflation yeah. has really made the debt. You can sell off something lesser. So I plan to pay out my 20 mil worth of debt with this screw in the future. Right? It's worth it. <laughs> it doesn't exist. Are we, are we, are we talking, uh, talking March? Are we talking February, 20, February 2023, Virtue? Or what do you reckon? I think that... <laughs> We're going to, a lot of people are going to be in store yeah, but, for something that they haven't but, seen yet, which is a hyperinflation in the next decade. Seven years, but you, eight years, gone. Go sorry, mate. Sorry. Sorry to cut you off on that. But I just want to hit no, on this Joe point. Is that, saying, bud, bud, bud. Sorry. sorry uh, but, however, um, the banks, they're throwing a spanner in the works because we can't borrow and buy seven properties today. Like the old buy 10, get 10, get buy 20, get 10, you're done. That doesn't really work anymore in today's wow. lending environment. How the hell do I buy 20 properties? It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely it's, possible, definitely possible. So I know people that, I know a chick that just bought 21 properties in four months. And I know a couple, mm -hmm. that's just a young chick about 30. Mm -hmm. And um, and I know someone that bought 28 properties last year um, as a couple. Um, and so definitely that's possible. because you're giving Sorry? the bank what they want understanding the parameters of the matrix people say you can't fly in the matrix but neo flew right he knew the whole real world was shit, right he knew that the world was fake but he knew the opposite that he had was eating porridge right people say they don't like the world today they can go live in the bush but who wants to go live in the bush right it might be simple people like it but if you understand how the matrix works then you can try and bend the parameters of it so you can do what you want inside the matrix and that's where finance comes in if you realize that the money never existed it's a banker's game the banks in the business people the stupidest thing i see in the world is people put a balaclava on their head take a gun go to the bank and say give me all your money right they're going to walk away with 10 grand 20 grand and 10 years in jail right people don't realize that the bank wants to give you the money they're in the business of giving you money right that's, that's their exactly their role to make that's what they do so if you can go in there and work out, okay, how much money can I get? They might say you can only borrow 200 grand. That's 200 today. But if you can increase your cash flow, if you can increase yeah. your servicing, they might say you can only borrow 500 grand because you've only got X amount of capital. They might say that you can only borrow 500 grand because you've got X amount of income. But if you can work out what the bank requires from you, then you can use that debt that you're collecting and acquire assets that are either going to bring you in high cash flow or high equity and take them back to the bank to then be able to get more debt from the bank. And it's understanding. Is, is, is this sort of, of is this where your your really fantastic and savvy mortgage broker comes in as well? Because or what sort of yeah, who do you speak to to sort of find out more about this? Problem is, is that when you go to the broker, if you do a million dollars worth of loans with a broker. They're going to get paid 
0.65% or whatever they get paid. They might get six and a half grand out of it, right? right yeah. If they write you one loan, they'll get six and a half grand. If they write you 10 loans at 100 grand, they're going to have to work 10 times the amount. And every time you pull out equity, you're not going to get paid. So you're just like, oh, it's easy to go and do this. So getting that guidance, getting that advice is come from trial and error and understanding what works and what doesn't. And with the amount of transactional flow that I've seen in my business is I've seen what works at a bank and what slides and what doesn't. And it's finding those glitches mm -hmm. and working out what the parameters of the banks are. So um, don't accept no for an answer. If the bank says no, work out, well, what do I need? The bank might say you fail servicing. How much do I fail servicing? Because then you can go home and improve that. If you're failing by 10 grand a year, mm -hmm. get another job, do whatever it takes to get there and then work out how do you stay in the bank's parameters to play. Um, so it's really a banker's game. Like it's, it's it, without the money, we can't do any of these deals. So structuring that portfolio is really, really crucial. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so would you, would you sort of say, oh, sorry, I was about to say, would, would you say probably the hardest part is getting the deposit for the first or the, the second one, once you've got that, then you can just sort of keep saying, well, what sort of, uh, switching and sort of saying, okay, well, how do I, is that probably the hardest part getting the first deposit? I'm going to give you something that's going to blow everyone's mind today, right? It's all hard, right? It's all <laughs> hard, right? All of it. My oh. life today is hard, right? Everything's hard, right? <laughs> it's just it's what, where are you going to give up? Where are you going to give up with the hardness? Where are you going to give up with the pressure that's put on you? People just go, oh, mm. it's too hard. It's like working 40 years of your life in a job that you hate to get sacked is not a fucking good life to live right like you don't have control of that like yes you don't have to worry about a bank calling you but you can have your boss calling you so once again you've got options right it's how you take those options but buying the mm -hmm. first one having the deposits was very hard until i understood how um you know <laughs> debt works and then i was like hang on a second i could go pull all this equity that i had and then it became an equity game but then it came a servicing game so each step I've had to try and work out what is the problem that's stopping me to get to the next level. I will not accept that I can't get to the next level. And I've got this saying, I heard it somewhere, I don't know where I got it to give credit, but new levels bring new devils. It's a part of the game. You're faced with adversity at every step. That's a great every quote of the week. There we go. <laughs> that should be your quote. <laughs> well, there we go. But adversity brings upon growth and it's overcoming those hurdles. Most people just get stopped and go, well, that's it. But yeah, think about it. Mm -hmm. The people at the bank that's processing the problem I've found, like I can't get past 20 mil worth of debt because I'm a single, like I'm an individual and I'm collecting this debt. When I hand my file to the broker or the bank, they can understand it as much as they want. When they go and hand it to their credit team, their assessment, it blows all their calculations out because it's not designed to meet that. So then I have to become more creative about how do I buy things? How do I structure things? What do I do with my things? How do I buy? I haven't had a loan for five years. All my loans are principal interest. I love every time I do a news article and all these people get in the comments and go, this guy's going to go broke. Watch till the interest rates go up. It's like, you know, they don't understand, right? Like it's solidified. There's like yeah. all those hotels, all cash, right? I've had to buy them. But if I didn't have the foundation portfolio, I wouldn't be able to use those properties to be able to buy hotels. I can't use the hotels. The view for when I get 100 motels is that I'm going to become a developer and I'm going to develop all the sites that I've picked up over the last 10 years. And I nearly broke myself in about 2016, 17. I was picking up like I've got, I calculated 200,000 square meters of land in Western Sydney, or Northwestern Sydney, um, where they sell now for a million bucks for 300 square meters. But at some point, I don't want to sell those properties. If I can use the cash flow from the motels, I can then use that cash flow. I want to make, I want to, my goal to get in the next four years is a million dollars a month passive to pay for developments. And I can just keep building from there. So, so goals seem to be a big thing for you. Like, Agreed. is this some, can you talk to that a little bit? Cause I'm interested in, I know we're going to take in, taking the conversation a little sideways, but, um, <laughs> I, I'm not much of a, I don't set goals like you set goals. And we also yeah. don't have a similar size set portfolio. Um, but I'd love to in, be interested. Yeah, How do you go that. about that? What does it, what does it look like? What does goal setting look like for you? So I think of it as a business plan. So um, most people say, I actually ask all my staff to do goals at the start of the year. So they send me sheets of what they want to do, who they want to become. And I'll go look for each and every one of them, but I try and critique them to say, Hey, your goals, I've got, 
just in my head office here, I've got like 100 staff. Um, and it's mainly just in the financial services businesses that I do that. But I'm like, hey, like, if you want to do X, Y, Z, people say, I want to be fit, right? I'll just use, you know, uh, I was joking beforehand about my hairstyle. Um, and when I cut my hair cut off, when I lose some weight, right? And I, I look at it and it's like, people say, I want to get fit. What does fit look? I want to go to the gym. Okay, let's go to the car park, have a beer and a cigarette, right? Is that going to make you fit, right? It's not, it's not specific enough. I'm going to go to the gym three days a week. Okay, let's go to the gym three days a week. Let's lift, uh, let's lift the texter. Like, oh yeah, let's bench, let's bench press the texter. Right, it's not going to do shit. So, what do we need to do? We need to go do the gym three times a week. We need to do cardio. We need to do phys- all those sorts of things play in. So, as an investor, as whoever, like you need to look at your goals and have like the vision of five years, ten years. Where do you want to be? And then break it down as what can I do in 2022? What can I do in 2023? And then reverse engineer the end goal of where you want to be and work it out so it becomes more of a to-do list so the actions and habits that you form are in line i could sit here now and go okay let's go down the pub and do bottle service and you know have a great old time but if i was to do that that's not how it became successful it's the the habits that are created it's the you know the options that you take and everything has like people have the opportunity i said at the start of this thanks for tuning in and watching all of us people have the opportunity now to watch married at first sight or to maybe learn something about building a portfolio. People have the opportunity to go to the football, get drunk, get beer at a TV and say, yeah, that's my team, right? But that's a distraction from their goals. So I don't see a value in that. It's not in line with my person of who I want to be and it's not going to keep me, get me towards that. So is it, for you, Birchie, is it is it more about the, the habits that you form rather than saying, okay, I'm going to have a $200 million property portfolio or is it about the $200 million property portfolio? No, no. So I'll just go back way to the start and when we're talking about buying some properties, um, I yeah. thought if I could earn 50 grand a year without ever working a day in my life again by the age of 30 and I thought... Yeah. Yeah, you fucking kidding yourself. Now, sorry for swearing if people get upset, right? Like, just you know, I've right. got no bleep on this, but I swear all the time. <laughs> I say it with love, right? But I'm like, there's no chance, right? If you told me that we'd be having this conversation, this would be going on 20 years ago, I'd say you're a liar, right? Yeah. Get off whatever you spoke and whatever. But it, it was a gradual progression because I had goals and I got to 10. I thought it was impossible to get to 10 properties and I'd never seen anyone do it. There was no information, no podcast, no one doing anything. And then when I got there, I was like, "This is this it? Like, there wasn't any confetti. Like, I don't actually celebrate anything, right? Like, I don't celebrate and go, oh, yeah, I just did another motel. The most that I did was I actually, I don't drink that often. There's, I've been given all the drink away that ended up on my shelves here. I had some really impressive bottles that people gave me over the years, and I give them away to people just for, you know, whatever. But I went, on my first motel, like, I bought 35 motels last year. Um, and the first one that I settled, I went and I had about 10, 15 minutes. It's the only time in 2021 that I celebrated anything really. I went to a liquor land next to my office. I bought a four pack of Jack Daniels. I took three people from my office, sat on the boot of my car and just went, oh, this is great. Like, I can't believe we just did that. This is amazing. And I got back to my day. And yeah, like looking at that point, it was like, okay, cool. Something new just started from here. But yeah, looking at the journey at the start, I never, if you told me in 2020 I'd be buying motels, I'd say you're a liar, right? I had two motels years ago. I still owned them all this time. I had them for about eight years. I rented them out full term occupancy. They're a bit troublesome to me. I never wanted to have them, but I was forced into going, that's a good investment because I didn't see value in lots of other things. And I was like, hang on a second, there's a lot of value here. If some idiot that's running it already can run it, if I come in from a corporate level with infrastructure hr marketing um branding um you know management all that sort of stuff legal team then i can do a great job if they're making money how can i make this be even better um so it's just evolving to go what do i need to do to the next level and to start off with it's just a simple goal of getting 10 properties um and i thought that's going to be a joke to get there and i got there at like 21 or something 22 wherever it was and I was like, let's push it to 20, let's push it to 30, let's push it to 50, let's push it to 100. Um, yeah, so. 
So it doesn't sound like you like it sounds like you're setting goals, but it also sounds like you're just working your ass off and you get the thing that you're after. You're like, okay, great. I want to buy hotels. Oh, well, I already got one hotel. Let's buy another one. Screw it. Let's let's get six hotels. Now I've got 34. Now what do I do? Oh, well, now I've got the infrastructure in the business to be able to to be able to do that. Um because it becomes comes game, first the like, goal or achieving the goal, I suppose. No, the goal, the goal has to start. The goal has to start. Like it's a it's mm-hmm. like a business plan to your own personal life. And I think a lot of people get themselves into let's just use a household for example, right? You've got mum, dad, two kids, whatever. They both work, kids go to daycare, come home from school, cook some food, go to bed, watch some, I don't know, married at first sight. Married at first sight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in that household, things go wrong with people's lives, right? What goes wrong? I don't know. The Lose husband the doesn't find the wife attractive, the financial issues, whatever the case may be. Why does the one of them go to stray? Why does that happen? It's because there's not excitement. But if you had parameters and go, okay, every Thursday night is, you know, dinner day and every Sunday night, every Sunday we spend with the kids and all that sort of stuff. Oh, you've got stuff to look forward to. infrastructure. Yeah. You've so got- do you have that, do you have that set out in your life? Right? Like, yeah, do you have, I'm because I feel like to get to your stage, you must have like Monday is this, Tuesday is this, Wednesday is this, like is, what does it kind of look like? Uh, Wednesday is leg day. <laughs> yeah. um, no day is gym day lately, but yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I actually carry around dumbbells in my ute tray now. So if I've got 10 minutes in between a phone call, I'll pump out some weights and stuff, right? Yes, I do work really hard. Yes, I do, you know, sacrifice a lot of things over the years. But for me, like a stress, like, um, what was it that someone said to me? They go like, Nathan, with your, with that, just one little thing, right? Just something that someone saw, they're like, with that alone, most people would gargle petrol right they'll just be like wow this is too stressful i look at them like okay it's a problem but everything's a problem right like it's only what you manifest it to be it's like it's a situation i think that that's a very good that's a very good point yeah yeah like- I, I was in a very similar situation um um a friend of mine was like i hate my boss yeah. but i tell you what i hate more is looking for work and doing interviews but yeah. i was like well to be honest you're gonna hate the rest of your life for the next 20 years or are you going to suck it up for the next two weeks, find a job, do the interviews, do all that stuff? It's compressed suckage or a long-term suckage that's going to go on forever and eternity. And what you're saying is suck it up and and go for do the hard stuff because at the end of it, you're going to be pretty happy. No, nothing worthwhile in life is ever easy. There's a new quote for you, right? Nothing God, meaningful is, is ever easy. And... It's like it's choosing your easy. It's choosing your hard to overcome. Like uh, going to work's hard. Like any stress is hard. Like I'm at a point now where I just, I'm just okay. It just happened. Like things happen, right? Is how you attend to it. So beforehand, I used to have like in my life just dollar productive activities, and now I look at it as like, is someone going to suck my energy? Is this going to waste my energy? Me as a human, I can't get time back. And, mm-hmm. you know, those relationships you form, the people you be around, the people you hang around, how you conduct your time, is it getting you close to those goals? If you have clarity with your goals and you have clarity with where you're going, then you know what to avoid and you know what to accept. And it can, you know, it's harsh, like, but it's like just performing on a different sort of level, I guess, like a mindset. And I don't get scared yeah. by this stuff. Like, you know, I have heaps of stresses every day. People go, oh, wow, it's the worst thing. It's like, well, it happened. We've got to deal with it. So be, right. so be it, right? And it's now that it's- <laughs> <laughs> How do we overcome it? How do we move forward and push on? Mate, I'm loving your your uh, contrarian thinking. It's not just contrarian investing. It's contrarian everything. You're just looking at the world through it. It sounds, it sounds kind of, uh, I'd say it's quite, um, what's the word, stoic. You, you, um, you sort of... You seem like a, yeah, I mean, I'm just, your, your energy is fantastic. Like there's not many people that have gotten to this hour 45 and it just sort of, I mean, maybe I'll, maybe I'll take as a little bit of a compliment, hopefully. But and Joe, yeah, Joe should as well. But um, I, I want to be con- conscious and mindful of, of your time. And I mean, I could. I'm just, fine. I can talk for, like, I've done four hour sessions, like just talking, I get excited. But you, you guys, and Joe Rogan, we get along. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe not now. I mean, talk Joe. <laughs> You know, I mean, I, I don't want to comment on whatever his kind of thing is. Yeah, let's. I, I'm interested in the questions because I'm seeing the questions yeah. popping off absolutely. Over mental. 105 comments, like 106 now. It's just crazy. Like, oh, everybody, like no, I don't think we're going to be able to get. 
get through all of them. But there was one. Um, yeah, Toddy. I want to point out Toddy because he was there for when I made the joke about him walking. So Toddy Sloan. Like, Pizza, Toddy Sloan po pointed out something that Scott said um, that was interesting. Hey, can you see the comments there, big name? All I can see. Yeah, yeah is I'm, I'm going through them now. Um, so I can't see the individual people. I've got a couple of um, people that I, I'm assuming that the people that are friends of mine. Oh, um, uh, yeah. You can just see their faces yeah. and stuff. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll pop no, up. Not, Jeff will pop them up on the it's screen. Not, it's whether, it's, they've, uh, whether they've signed into the Matrix. Or we'll do it like this. It's all about. This is what we're all about. Put on a ballot for a robber bank. So I, don't, I don't know where that came from. But uh, we're not we're not advocating that at all. Please, no, people, do not. We don't give take financial advice. Need. We don't give advice on how to not get money. Right? We're trying to highlight that if you go get your money that way, there's different ways of getting it. If yeah. you get it that way, it's not the most energy wise. You're gonna waste ten years of your life. It's worse than a job. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's that's good. That's good advice. <laughs> Are you talking about the uh, so Toddy? Toddy said I'd be interested to hear Nathan's thoughts on Scott Hosh, uh, Scotty H's comments above. Is that what you were talking about? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So, so those with long-term fixed Scotty, debt benefits the most from money printing and its associated. So you could fix the um, you could fix the interest rate. You know, and a lot of people go to fix their rates, but you're really taking a bet against the bank. Right, and the bank's making a yes. lot more profit when they fix them at a higher rate. Like if you can get a loan at three percent and the fixed rates at three point five, if the interest rate comes down, the bank's going to make a lot more cash out of you. So these guys in the back end of the banks, I wouldn't say they're the smartest in the world, but they're much. They've got a lot more resources than all of us collectively do um, to to navigate through. Um, you know, how are they going to make their profit? So. If anyone wants to know, like I haven't fixed any of my rates in um, at all. I may fix a couple of them soon oh, just because it. it's an admin thing. But uh, you need to be mindful and no financial advice, of course. But mm. be mindful if you're going to fix the interest rates um, and you're going to sell the property, you might have to pay a break fee. If you're going to fix the interest rates and you've got equity and you can't pull your equity out, then yeah. your equity, equity is going to be trapped for two years. If someone's equity was trapped, if they locked the interest rate in 2019 for three years, they wouldn't be able to get the equity out now if they couldn't yeah. do it. They'll be paying a higher interest rate, so the break fee would be massive, and therefore they've missed out on a whole boom where they could have tripled their wealth and their net worth position. So. Yeah. yeah, so mm. it's kind of a bit of a bit of a risk potentially to be able to do that, but then it depends on what somebody wants to do or what somebody's goals are. Interesting this Correct. question. I think this is probably uh, yeah. I got rid of the wrong. That's that's the wrong one. So I think yeah, or was that the one you wanted to bring up, Joe? Sorry. Yeah, well, no, that tied in nicely. Yeah. If it, so, inflation goes to twenty percent for the long term. Interest rates yeah. will then go to twenty three percent, right? Because the inflation's growing, so they're trying to mm. capture that with interest rates. It would be in, in an ideal situation, it would sound correct. However, the world is different than when interest rates were 20% going back many years ago. Um, people like a house price of 100 grand versus a house price of one and a half million dollars, the cost of the interest at 4% or 5% at the RBA would be like going up to 20%. So the amount, if we go back yeah. to the cost of how much that weekly repayment would be for someone, it's all if relative, it's relative. So if interest rates went, if the if everybody's interest rate went to six percent, it'd be like, you know, crashing the economy. On a million dollars, that'd be that'd be sixty that'd be sixty k purely in interest. If it went to twenty percent on a million dollars, that's two hundred k in interest alone. Correct. The system would crack way before that. I believe that the system has in it a potential of a 225 basis point increase. If you go and have a look at the most of the countries around the world that have had interest rate rises of recent time, they've only gone up, they've always gone up in 25 percent increment, uh, 25 basis point increment. So um, quarter percent, half percent, one percent, 75 basis points, whatever. But now they're putting up interest rates by 10 basis points. If they just put the interest rate up by 1%, I think everybody will be in trouble. But it doesn't mean that I reckon that in this next decade, we could get 50 years of inflation in five years. That's the extreme of our currency, that the situation. If you think about yeah. a paddle pop in 
it, pedal pop and this is where debt becomes irrelevant right and money loses its value in 2008 i used to smoke cigarettes i've never had a vice i used to smoke two packs a day and um i'd go to the servo for many many years i quit like four years ago or so um and um when i'd buy the smokes i hear them go like oh yeah we'll have a cigarette but um when i'd go buy a pack of smokes i'd buy a paddle pop every day right i had a, a tobacco addiction and i had a paddle pop addiction i'd go buy a paddle pop the, you know whichever one was there i'd pick one up and they started off at like 80 cents for a paddle pop and then it went up to a dollar dollar twenty dollar fifty two dollars for a paddle pop I was like wow it's gone up and then when i stopped smoking i think they were about two dollars twenty per paddle pop so if you had a thousand bucks, you could have twelve hundred paddle. Pops. Are, are you a billabong or are you a buffalo bill? I, I kind of no, I just I'll go for the paddle pop. But okay. but they used to be better. Like the paddle pop used to be better. It had more colours and swirls, and now it's just got exactly. I mean, I haven't had one in probably 10, 15 years, so I don't know. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I wanted to bring this one one up from Aaron because I I, I sort of follow it a little bit more now that I, I listen to sort of economic and there's a yeah. podcast called All In, which is. I, yeah. I think that whilst what they're saying, what they do may be two completely different things because they haven't done anything yet. They've said they're going to do it, but. They actually tried to tighten. So what we've got is a thing called a ZERP, a zero interest rate policy. Um, mm -hmm. In 2018, 2017, 18 and 19, they tried to tighten uh, monetary policy, which is raising interest rates. And when they did that, um, the system crashed in and around September, 2019. And they got to a point where they had to drop all the interest rates again. So they can try and increase the interest rates all they want, but each low, of, if you could actually um, pick up the, look, go to a website and type in like Australian uh, interest rate chart or US interest rate chart and bring up a chart over 25, 30, 40 years, whatever the maximum chart it is, you'll see that every time they raise interest rates, it goes to a lower low, a lower high. So it can never get back to where its old interest rate was. And if it was, it would stay there for a very quick period of time. And then they'd have to bring it back down because it would cause so much pain to the market. And now if we, if we had, a, if we had a, our interest rate here in the country, in Australia, for example, was uh, 150 basis points or 1.5%. So if they pushed up the interest rate by uh, 1%, that'd be like a 70% increase in interest rate. But now, because it's so low, if they put the interest rate up by a half percent, that means it would go up five hundred percent. Yeah, because yeah. they're at 0 0.1. So going going to point six would be oh point five. So do you do, one one of the things that I see is well, the one of the things that I think about is it's not necessarily the outcome of like the the actual outcome of raising rates. It's more about the perception that is going to drive people to think about it, right? So if interest rates do go up. People are going to be like, whoa, I'm very scared right now. I am scared. I'm not going to be starting buying. I need sentiment. to chill out for a little bit. And that sentiment drives through the market, which then slows things down. So is that like a self-fulfilling prophecy? Like, does that slow everything down and make well, it's it? Propaganda. So, I mean, it's propaganda to push things up, to push things down, to try and control the minds of people. Like, you can't trust what you're reading in the news. Like, it's all controlled. I've been on TV over 100 times. I tell them the truth, they cut it out the video bit, right? They don't put it on there. And it's like the advertisers don't like it. They've literally sold me. The advertisers don't like it. It's like, so who's controlling things around here, right? Who's control? Every person is reading something on a TV screen. They're not talking like we are. They're reading a teleprompter. They're reading something from a script. The question I ask is who writes that script? And the script doesn't come just from the teleprompter to the media. The, the script comes from the politicians. Who writes the politician's speeches? Who writes every speech? What's the agendas that are getting pushed? What is the what we need to do to get things in you know harmony and, and, and whatnot? And you can see the glitches in the matrix. It's like the black cat walking past, right? Deja vu. And it's like you put all these things together and you start seeing a different picture than yeah, what's out there. Yeah, um, I mean, I've got there's an interesting um, question that's come through. I'll, I'll have a look who this is, but um, I mean, not we're not we can advise on somebody's situation. Do do you have to? consider your own situations people but let's say generally on it so, so what it says hi nathan in, in yeah, a high hyperinflation period property prices surge and rents are always being reviewed once a year so there is a delay rent can't keep up do you suggest lowering an lvr and a higher cash position towards 2076 towards 2028 there will be a point and this is um a good thing to go look at right like we we haven't experienced this in australia right and when I started talking about this five years ago, people were like, you know, get you off your head, whatever. 
but people are starting to see it, right? And everything that we've seen is not right that's happened in the last few years. But if we go and look at other currencies, other history in other places where these things have occurred, there's sort of clues that get left. That's all I can relate to because none of us have ever seen a hyperinflation. It's just sort of calculating the amount of M1 that's out there. If they pull the levers, what would be... It's like having a flow chart of what would be the outcome and it all leads back to a couple of options, which... Um, which is options that they pull. There will be a point, I don't know when it would be, that I would want to pay out all my debt because there will be a currency reset, in my opinion, where a currency will go to nothing, right? It'll lose all of its value and we go, okay, no one wants that anymore. We've got to go to a different currency. And it's in that period you want to pay out your debt. It's nowhere near now. I have no fear of debt. I'm very comfortable with levels of debt that I hold. Uh, but everyone needs to be comfortable with their own position. Um, you know, some people will get yeah. too over leveraged and they'll get wiped out. Some people will be under leveraged. And the people that are under leveraged and it never gets talked about is if we look at someone that saved up a million dollars, right? And then they can't go and buy a house anymore. You, you might have sold your house two years ago. You, you got a big mansion and now you've taken this money, you're going to put it in the bank, you think you're okay. And then suddenly inflation starts creeping in. You can only buy half the amount of paddle pops now, a quarter of the amount of paddle pops. You can't even feed yourself that well. You're going to be moving into a unit from your mansion. That's too under leveraged. So you need to find the balance of what's right for you with your cash flow position, your asset position at any point. If you look at Turkey, there was a point where interest rates, I believe maybe four years ago, went up to like 60% for a very short period of time. I could be delusional on it, but I'm very sure it was the Turkish lira where interest rates and the cash rate went up so high. But the only reason when cash rates go up so high, it could have been Venezuela. It was one of them where interest rates mm. have gone up so high because the inflation ran away so much. But if you, if someone was getting paid 50 grand a year, a Big Mac's $5, um, rent 300 bucks a week, all that sort of stuff. Turkey. Yeah, Turkey was confirmed. Yeah, I thought it was Turkey. Um, so with, um, if we have, um, so let's just use... 50 grand a year analogy. This is where I think the real importance is for, for investing. 50 grand, if you're paying 300 bucks a week or 400 bucks, that's like 15, 20 grand a year in rent or mortgage. It's acceptable. Your food bill might cost you 20 grand a year, 10 grand a year, whatever. If we see hyperinflation, that 50 grand wage goes to a million dollars, right? But if a big back meal is 200 grand, if rent goes to 500 grand a year, imagine if rent went to 500 grand a year and people were earning a million bucks. Your That's loan right. would be paid out within a day, right? Yeah. So there would be a point when you see inflation run way out. You cannot believe the CP lie, which is the CPI, because it's full of lies. They say 2.8, 3.2, whatever. What, tell me anything that's gone up by 3% or less in the last year. Nothing, right? Apart from maybe some precious metals and stuff like that, which is another topic. But where there'll be a point when everything runs away and it would be very easy to pay out a mortgage my mortgages have become so easy to pay out over the years i could pay them out but at the point when i bought them i thought it was going to go bust like every time i bought one it's like oh it's another loan how can i get the loan it wasn't about getting it it was just the bank giving me the debt so each time i've gone to buy initially buying properties i didn't have the deposits then I didn't have the servicing and I've had to go and generate that artificially to then prop it up. So I might need to go buy a property that gives me high cash flow. And then from that, I then use that cash flow to service to buy a property that's got high equity. And I rip out that equity and I go buy some more properties with high cash flow. And yeah, I think it's very important to look at the stages of where you're at because yeah, like, like collecting debt is very important. As a part of it, every country has debt. Every large, every company on the stock market has debt. Debt's used and sloshed around the back end everywhere. As an investor, people shouldn't fear it, but they should fear the stupidity of it. So, err with caution. Yeah. 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 So you're saying it's kind of you're telling. saying you need to build the cash buff, like have a debt situation going on, but also have somewhat of a cash buffer to be able to sustain it if there's a there's a rainy day, a little rainy day fund. To be yeah. able to keep you going, if there, are, if it goes either way, you know, swings one way, it's not good. Swings the other way, it's not good. But you're supportive both ways. You can protect yourself either way. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, let's um let, let's let's uh one. let's let's get we'll, we'll probably have two or three more questions because we'll get into i, I want to hear i mean i know we've spoke a little bit about towns on cans but i think yeah. i know you're pretty you might be bullish on this but this is edgar so he asked this probably 20 minutes yeah. ago what are your thoughts on regional areas yeah definition of regional areas how far right yeah. um I want to look for infrastructure i want to look for longevity of a place i want to look for value um, there's areas that you know people speculate and they will go and read a property magazine and see some glorified spruker and every time i hop into facebook i just see all these new property people out there that are like oh i'm a expert i've worked at Maccas and cleaned the shelves and it's like some of them are like i know you're a liar but we'll leave that to the side there's other people out there that have got you know these glossy properties here's a dual key investment all these things 10 years ago i saw people getting walked out to every mining town around the country and they'll go like you buy a house it's got a 1500 dollars a week rent it's got this those areas are so remote they have nothing they're just loaded with risk and are a bomb so it's where the value comes in so if i'm getting value if i go to a town and i pick up something for 50 grand i'm like okay that's could be good value if i'm buying a property for 50 grand and it's an old fibro thing that's all rickety looking i don't want to touch it i don't want to touch anything to give me work it means stress for me today in the early days i used to go and pull apart secondhand houses that were being knocked down literally demolition sales right where they take they're knocking the house over i'll say to someone back when i first started i had no money i had to use capital i had to use my sweat equity i would physically say give me a day i'll give you 500 bucks give me a day and let me do whatever i want to your house and they go okay i'll take the beams out of the roof i'll take the clip block sheeting off the roof i'll take the vanities out i even took the toilets out and took the carpet out and i built my renos from my houses myself i would never touch them ever again because it's just it slows me down too much but i did because i had to on that day to overcome the hurdles there's a video floating around of when i was living in a pub for 35 days and i built a reno of a house I paid 30 grand and I basically built a house out of secondhand materials off eBay in Musselbrook in, in New South Wales in a mining boom. But how far regional? If it has a Maccas, if it has a KFC, if it has an Audi, has Woolworths, like generally towns of about 10,000 people would be in those locations. Um, you've brought up Townsville a few times, but Townsville is bigger than the size of Hobart. It's almost the size of Darwin as a city. So it's Queensland's yep. largest regional. There's actually some areas with infrastructure that are going through. And I pick up this sort of information just from my motels because I see the clientele that come through and they all get booked out sometimes and that. And there's like inland rail projects and different things that are occurring, which will open up these sort of more rural and more regional areas. Um, and there's a very controversial topic that I don't really want to go into the controversy of it, but smart cities, right? Smart cities, I think they could be the most evil thing that anyone has ever concocted to have people trapped in these smart grid cities in the future. But they won't be using the infrastructure of these currencies. They will create them as little hubs. And some of those areas could take off big time if you're into speculating over 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and talking about the speculation of these things, I'm always thinking when I'm buying something of the long term, not of the short term. Because if you're thinking of it of 12 months, two years, three years, you're gambling when it comes to something, you're just hoping that you're going to get a profit. I'm looking at the bigger picture of how does this fit into my 10-year strategy, my 10-year, 20 15 years, sorry, 20 year strategy. Yeah. So, I so take what, what other rules, what other rules have you got for, for purchasing? Because under Maccas, has to have a Maccas, has to have an Audi. Well, it doesn't have to have an Audi, but Maccas, Audi's, KFC, has to be a 10,000. What are, what are some other rules? Um, if I'm, the further I'm going out, like I'll look at the value of the risk. And I'll, I'm not going to look at, okay, there's a mine going out here or there's a bit of, um, demand going into this yeah. coastal town at the moment also yeah. I, I went up to like last year i bought i sort of bought two places on the water um on the coast I, I was doing a video with todd when i was in one of the places um i was trying to find a place on the central coast i had a specific reason as to why i wanted to pick up something there like last year i needed to get it done very quickly and then i was like everything that i was buying for 200 grand in the central coast like 10 years ago 250 grand for houses are now selling for 1.2 million dollars right it's berserk right um i just won't play in that game i don't want to be involved in that market there could be a point when money loses all of its value 
I'll take any of I'll take anything. Um, the worst investment for me is money. I just hate it. it gives no, cash. Worst, <laughs> no cash. No cash. Yeah. Is the worst yeah. So, so somebody, um, somebody asked. Oh, sorry, Joe. Which one are you bringing up? No, no. Go. Um, Mark so Mark Skelly. said you sound like you get some great. Oh, you know Mark. You know. I t- I know Mark. Oh, okay. He said this makes sense in everyone's language, but how does the average investor get these deals in competitive markets like we are now? Does this conflict with the easy to buy, hard to sell concept? I'm, I'm not sure. What's this easy to buy, hard to sell concept? I'd imagine that you know it's a dog of a property. No one wants to oh, yeah. you know, just go pick it up. No, but you can't sell it to anybody. Yeah. 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 Um, Look, I think it's important to know markets and know and understand regions. Um, and like, I used to spend about eight hours a day, like literally, like I'd, when the internet first came out, I'd love having like access to the internet at work. I'd be trying to find these things when the phone got the internet and it wasn't a Blackberry with the ball on it, you know, going through timeline of technology, like it's been easier and easier to build relationships and research data. But um. I'd spend like eight hours a day researching markets. Still to this day, every single day, I probably spend three hours or so looking at some point on the real estate websites, whether it be any of them, being commercial, yeah. residential, any of the different brands, um, trying to understand and see what glitches there are. And I could tell you, if you, if you showed me a hundred properties right now on the screen and go, good, not good, not good, whatever, I could walk you street by street through places I've never even been to. Uh, I think I've got a photographic memory. I think that's what it's called. So I remember shit from five years ago. I can tell you street by street sales, who owned them, what they bought. My clients know that I know their portfolios because I just remember them all. But most importantly, that data, like I've done probably like 15,000 real estate transactions over the last 15 years or so. Um, Agents like dealing with me because I try and remove all the problems. So a lot of people will say, I want to buy this property, but I'm going to come out on Tuesday. I'm going to look at it, whatever. For me, it's like, hey, look, I just want to buy this property. If it's a real estate agent I haven't spoken to, when I call them up, it's like, hey, Mr. Real Estate Agent, I'm just calling you about a property that you've got. I just want to work out how I need to buy it. Can you please call me back and tell me what your trust account details are? Because if I say, hey, it's about this property, they've got like 50 people <laughs> calling about the property. They call the phone, they're like, oh, which property do you want to buy, right? It's like, oh, yeah, this one. Like, oh, there's lots of things. Yeah, like, wow. That's, what, that's like, interesting. Like, get their attention, piss everyone else off, and then try and... So hang on. Yeah. And then, then what? At least a resistance. Yeah. So a real estate agent wants... To make a deal happen they don't want to have to waste their saturday and then have the potential of the buyer pulling out and all that sort of stuff if you can remove all the re- all the other parts of it then the price they don't give a crap really if it's 10 grand cheaper than the others or whatever reality like 80 percent of agents just so what deal. what do you look for when you make the phone call because obviously you've done thousands of phone calls to real estate agents right so what are the key points that you try and pull out of that call like I'm calling an agent. Let's say you didn't get his voicemail. We go and deep dive in the property property stuff, not you know economy stuff here. But um, I have zero emotion, right? Like I love my mum, right? Like my mum's eighty, right? If I put my mum in my business, she would be annoying in my business. I tell her to her face, right? She, I'd put my mum in my business because I love her. And I'd love to see her every day in my business, right? So it'd give me a great opportunity to see my mum every day. However, is my mum the best person to put in my business, right? I could find someone with a lot more skill set on that sort of stuff, right? My emotion would say, put my mum in the business because it's the right thing because I get to see her every day. That's an emotional decision, not a logical decision. Whenever it comes to a property, I have zero emotion, right? zero emotion gets you killed in business in any decision that i've ever made i think i was saying to you guys the other day like in my property investing i've always treated it like a business um people go what problems have you occurred over you know your 20 years of investing they're pretty minimal um most of them were opportunity costs and things that i could have done smarter and done the deals that i've regretted the ones i didn't do in my business there's shit loads right of problems that i could have avoided and most of them because of emotional sort of decisions that i make a emotional over logic because i think someone's good or whatever when it comes to your investing if you think about the property people go i must have this house as soon as you say i must have it you're screwed because you're attached to it 
All I want is the numbers. If the numbers don't stack up, get out of my face. That's what, how I have to look at a deal and analyze it. So um, it's not about, I couldn't care if the place is in Townsville, Cairns, Perth, Sydney. If the numbers are going to be that I can pull out 50 grand equity, that's what I want. I want the 50 grand equity. I want the cash flow to be able to keep the bank happy to go and buy more properties. So, um, yeah, there's no emotion about the property. I do not give any shit about the property. It doesn't matter so where it is or what it is. Even what if it's the next kind of property I have. I don't care. What, what does it kind of sound like? Because um, I know that everyday people don't call real estate agents every single day. So yeah, is, yeah. the first thing you're just saying, hey, how's it going, Mr. Agent? Um, I'm just looking for the price of X because most of the time they're not listing the price um, yeah. nowadays. Like, how, how's it go? So I want to build rapport with you, Joe. I'll be like, hey, Joe, it's Nathan here. Um, just calling out about a property you got for sale. Oh, yes, Nathan, how can I help you? Look, I really need to, I really want to make this, a deal happened today um i was just wondering firstly if you got the contract you know what where would i need to pay the deposit so i'm getting their attention like to close the deal and they're like what fucking yeah, property need, are you, about? you don't <laughs> even talk about <laughs> yeah so i'm not talking about oh can you tell me does this house have nice floor coverings i don't give a shit right i'm buying it so far below market when i look at it i'm looking at the property as you know on a worst case scenario, I don't even want to see any of my properties, right? I want to buy it that I have to rip out the kitchen, rip out the bathroom, the bathroom screwed, the kitchen screwed, and I'll still make money on the thing. So that's what I'm thinking when I'm doing a deal. Agents, when they list properties, right? I wouldn't call an agent just to speculate about a property in a specific area, not worth my time. What I'm looking for is an agent. It could be an out of area agent. So if you think about it, all the people mm -hmm. selling properties in the country are people that are human beings, right? They all have emotions, right? So I wanna get in there and crack their emotions. I wanna think psychologically, what are they doing? What do they want out of this phone call? What do they wanna get out of their day? The guy might be sitting there going, oh, the market's shit. The guy might be sitting there going, fuck, I don't wanna go on the weekend to show this place 50 times, right? I, I, got, go I got I got I got too many buyers. I have to get back to all these phone calls. And, and you just say to them, hey, hey, I want to take this off your hands today. You don't have to call yeah. the other 20 buyers. What do I need to do to make your life easy? How do we get this? But started? I want to make sure like but the other thing is like if let's say we put I, I've got no idea what this glass is worth, right? I've got absolutely no fucking idea what the glass is worth, right? What's this glass worth? What do you reckon, Jeff? Uh let's say all 50 right. cents. Joe? All the 20. <laughs> well, it could be two bucks, right? Yeah. You just gave 70 cents, right? Which is about 60% of its value difference compared to each other of the value of the glass. That's a spread, right? We don't all have the same view. I don't know. That I'd say 10 bucks for six of them or something. So it's like about a buck 50, right? All our views, if we look at every car on carsales.com, we will see that you might find a white Commodore that's 18 grand, not 22 grand like the rest of them that person it could be the person needs to sell it could be whatever the reason is it could just be that they listed it wrong it could be that they don't want to deal with all the inquiries this first one comes picks it up take it off my lawn as an agent we don't know what their thought pattern is they could be like i sold a unit in this complex this is why i like units like a lot of people ask me houses versus units i love units townhouses and villas and all that sort of stuff very much so over a lot of houses because you know you've got direct comparisons you know that there's 20 units in the block you can go and you know, compare it to. So if the agent sold one three months ago for 200 grand and there's another agent just sold one two weeks ago for 280 grand and this agent goes, well, I sold the last one for 200. I'll be ripping Nathan off if he buys it for 230. If you can pay me 230, happy, right? The vendor's already primed at 200. I say, look, I'll give you 230 for it. Tell me the contract, whatever. I don't want to trade any minute. I don't want a minuscule of doubt to that conversation. I just want that shit. I know what I'm picking up and I know I'm taking it off it. So I, I joke about it. I feel like I'm rolling. I just want to throw, throw this one in there. Uh, I, yeah. I mean, let's, I mean, I don't know if all the contracts you sign. I load but, every I mean, single one of my contracts up for my investors when I do deals with a buyer's agent. Um, I load the contracts up with 21 day finance, pest building and due diligence clause. I actually built my own set of clauses which have got extra parts yeah. in them. Um, so I've never lost a dollar of a deposit for anyone over 15,000 transactions in the last 12 years, 13 years in this business. So um, 
always want to make sure there's an exit. If I'm putting someone onto a deal and it does have to go unconditional, I'll know that the person's got full amount of cash to be able to buy that property. So the allocation of that deal would be to a person that would be able to, you know, settle it and then get a loan in a month's time if they had to. Um, and yeah, well, the way the way I like to think about it is um, property like shares, right? It's a very efficient market. Everyone's got the data, everyone's got the access, everything's got that. But in property, it's an inefficient market because you're dealing with emotions and people. Like yeah. today, I got an opportunity. I got a, a real estate agent to send me a deal because I built a relationship with him, and sure. it was loaded as a three bedroom property. Mm. But I know that area is a four bedroom it's a like if that was a four bedroom property it wouldn't be at 500,000 it would be at 580,000 but yeah. what happened is they have a they called it a study instead of calling it an extra bedroom but it's got the dimensions of a bedroom all of yeah. a sudden i'm activating in this inefficient market because he's like my job three bed this one 500 uh, this one four bed 580 but now all of a sudden i'm like up. nobody else picked that up joe did they not yet no because i got sent it just today and i'm signing the contract uh, tomorrow because yeah, you've got to so move fast yeah. move fast on the inefficiencies as soon as it goes to market i'm done there's no opportunity it's five they're on yeah. 580. i get probably about 50 60 percent of the deals that i buy still today for my investors and that off market um, and I actually yeah. send agents out to go get it. And like I'll be like, listen, that property was really great. If you can get me 10 more of them, I'll have unconditional contracts. So the agent then in that relationship with me is like, fuck, like I sold 10 properties in the last quarter. I could sell them this week, 10 properties. I could have the next two months off, three months off if I just get Nathan what he wants and it's a proven thing. So they'll go out there and scout what I want. So I actually turn the agents into my, it's really bad if I say it, but you know what we're turning him into, right? We're well, turning him into our, they're working for us. Right, they're working yeah. for me. Right, they're giving me. I mean, but I ultimately, well, no. the, the way I see the real estate, yeah. I see the real estate agent somebody to broker a transaction. I mean, yes, they work. They do work for the vendor, and they're doing lots of stuff. But the vendor doesn't have to do anything. They don't. They don't have to sign a contract or something they don't want to do. Correct. So. Correct. No, so, no, but I, also, like, I, I had an agent text me the other day. Um, hey, I know I really like you, Joe. Blah blah blah. Um, just letting you know, I just missed out on a property sold by this guy. I think it would be perfect fit for you. And it's like, holy crap, that's a re that's relationships. That's people right. like you're having a good off, you know, you're having a good conversation with them, that kind of stuff. But um, yeah. again, inefficiency. But it's not like they're trying to rip off the vendors or anything. If we Correct. give a great price and yeah. that's what the vendor wants because, again, inefficient markets. That vendor wants 120-day settlement, absolutely fine. No, no owner-occupier is going to give that to them. But I look yeah. at it, I'm buying something that's worth 580. I'm buying it now at 500. And then in three months time, when it settles, I'm could be worth 500 price, price, got my 580, put four bedrooms on it on core logic, revalue it. We're at 610. And that's something that's like, I'm, I'm the king of trying to get below market value, right? It's the, my number one thing. But I don't really want to go into it because we're live and all that. I get excited sometimes. But I think that <laughs> <laughs> one thing that I've realized recently is the price doesn't even matter, right? Okay. In the scheme of the fact that the world, the money never existed, right? No. So when exactly. I go to my motels, sometimes the terms are more important because I'm not looking mm. at just a, a two dimensional, three dimensional transaction. I'm looking at multi dimensionals. Like, I went on to my Instagram yesterday and I saw that there was a pub menu out for a pub. I'm like, shit, I'm hungry looking at this pub menu. I've never even been there, right? It's mine. Yeah. <laughs> I've never looked at it. <laughs> I saw that one too. Like it's about, I want a pub feed now. Damn it. There's bottle late. shops, right? There's um, a Chinese restaurant. I own a Chinese restaurant, a very high ranking Chinese restaurant in Cairns, right? It's like, it's very profitable and all that. Uh, you ain't going to see me sell dim sims. I don't know. I don't know anything about it, but I it came as a part of a transaction and it just is what it is. So because there's so many moving parts, sometimes the terms are much important because I can collect other bits of cash flow from the deal as well. So I'm looking at it from, okay, yeah. how can I create my own parts outside of this system, right, that don't really involve, you know... Oh, mate, I feel, I feel like this is a conversation that we need to get on for another time because I feel like it's an it's like opening up a Pandora's box that I'd love to open up to, but I do realize we're at two hours and 20 minutes. And yeah. uh, the longest, uh, should... the longest session you've ever, ever done. So, really, I mean, of course, yeah, there you go. That's quite the honor, Nathan. But, uh, thank you, 
Thank you so much for giving us the run through, mate. I think um, you've opened a lot of people's eyes to just not oh, just people getting... saying no. Jesus, people, people want to just not going. just getting fed <laughs> what they <laughs> not just Joe's eating go what they've got fed. Um, well, I've got to fly, I've got to fly to Brisbane tomorrow and buy property, so I've got a very early flight to get to. So that's why I'm like trying to speed this up. But we'll get we'll get get you on again, Birchie. Um, how can people get in touch with you if, in the first come back. if you come back? Yeah, no, I'll come back. This is like I could talk for hours. Hey, like I I get excited and um, I'm cool to talk about whatever. If people have questions of things they want me to cover. Maybe we could do some questions and answers and and all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, if people would, uh, <laughs> would you go on Australian Survivor? I mean, I don't know. I, I don't think you'd be able to. I don't think you'd be able to. Be able well, that's how you lose twenty kilos. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. No, nah, look, I, I just, I, I'm actually pretty boring nowadays. Hey, like I'm really just like I live a very simple life, and it just seems like too much for me. Like I try to keep everything very simplistic, um, and just. You know, that's why I can go through so many things and do so many things. But it has been really awesome chatting with you guys and I appreciate you having me on and having me a part of your community. And, um, yeah, if, if people do want to get in touch, like... Yeah, how do they do it? Is there like a like a thing underneath my name that says Nathan Birch be invested.com.au? Yeah, they can say it. Yeah. Um, I run all different businesses. I'm not here to, you know, sell everyone stuff. Um, I started a buyer's agency before anyone even knew what a buyer's agency was going back. 13 years ago um, at Be Invested. It was one of the first ones out. Um, I have a law firm, accounting practice, financial planning, um, uh, net property management nationally. Um, I get annoyed with certain things that I see out there that I go and build businesses. So I've got about a dozen different financial services based businesses um, and they're in all different locations. Um, and I basically, I've got some computer software that I built years ago, um, all different random stuff. But core stuff I do where I actually perform tasks for my investors is I help them build property portfolios from scratch or from wherever they're at and help them get over hurdles. So if you need help on getting yourself from one area to another, um, can contact my office, 1300-367-925 uh, or email us at admin at beinvested.com.au. So it's B-I-N-V-E-S-T-E-D.com.au. And that's about it. I've got shitloads of content on YouTube and Facebook and yeah. Instagram and stuff like that. Um, I was probably one of the first. Check out, uh, check out the archives. Go, go back to your property yeah. from uh, Mount Druid. In uh, yeah, that's crazy sort of stuff. Crazy. Before viewing. my hair was grey, and uh, I was a lot skinnier, and I was a little less out there. I was very shy, and I didn't say stuff so fast, and so you know, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, you're you're amazing the way you are. Thank you for sort of being a, a big part of the, I suppose, the property investing community and just, um, I suppose, figuring out that your own challenges and then sort of getting beyond those challenges. Because I think hopefully uh, a lot of people have a lot of people have worked out, uh, sort of taking some value from tonight, and uh, really appreciate them. Um, and everybody's still there's still over a hundred people watching. So it's um, yeah, people are just yeah, people are tuning yeah, in. I, right, I think I appreciate it, man, because you you don't look at the world through the lens that you've been given. You've you've created and crafted your own lens over years of identifying, you know, property and looking at it from a different perspective. And that's what's given you the ability to have twenty million dollars worth of debt on assets that are probably 125, 130 million dollars worth of stuff. And you don't get there by following the nine to five and doing the things that that you know that and normal with, people do. Without getting adversity uh either like i think that a lot of people because i saw there was some questions somewhere i think it was maybe on your post or something people were saying how do i get over you know finance hurdles and stuff like that like the hurdles yeah. that are out there mm -hmm. that everybody has there's no secret to it that's like hidden it's not like oh uh, you know this is what you need to do it's like having the the determination to push through if you have clarity on what you're trying to achieve and you have um you know a burning desire to get there then you know just keep pushing forward don't accept no don't accept what you're given just keep working out okay you said no you can't help me but who can help me this is my vision and it's very easy i remember actually walking to a bank and the bank all said no i couldn't get loans i was at like 25 properties and because i gave it all in an excel spreadsheet presented like a business plan the guy actually wanted to 
helped me out and he had clarity. So he saw my vision and started giving me loans. And I think it's important to just keep refining wherever you're at to come overcome the hurdles of where people are stuck at. That could be the last thing I can awesome. leave her on. Yeah. Love that, great, man. great thing to finish on. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Nathan. Let's do it, guys. Let's go buy a property. Get a month. Good luck, guys. And uh, keep keep kicking ass with your goals for everyone and make 2022 your best year, eh? <laughs> yeah, 2020 your best decade. Let's do it.